Okay, we're recording. Thank you. Um, we had a little sound difficulty, so we're slightly delayed. Um, good evening. It is December 12th, 2022, and this is a special meeting of the town council called so that we can catch up on our agenda items. On November 7th, 2022, an act was signed into law which extends the suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. However, I'd like to point out, we have a quorum of the council in the room tonight. Uh, the meeting is uh, accessible to you in the audience in real time via Zoom, by phone, in person in the town room, and on Amherst Media. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the December 12th, 2022 town council meeting to order at 635. I'll call upon each councilor by name. At that time, please unmute and say present, and then remember to mute again. Uh, I'm going to start with Shalini Balmill, who, Balmill, who will be joining us later. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer's present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Uh, Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Present. Thank you. And if you'll just keep a lookout for Shalini and let me know when she arrives, okay? She may be coming to the actual town room. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. Uh, to make a comment or ask a question, please use the raise hand button if you're on Zoom. And all of us on the council are on Zoom. Uh, if technical difficulties arise as a result of use of utilizing remote participation, we'll decide on how to address that at the time. Um, and Again, please let Athena and I know if you have difficulties. I wanna mention on the announcements, just a couple of highlights. Though on December 19th, 2022, we will do a state of the town address as part of our regular meeting at the beginning of the meeting. That will be at 5.30. I saw also invite any of you who would like to join us at five o'clock where we will be swearing in new first responders. There are additional upcoming committee meetings and I'll note one change uh, and that is the finance committee. Andy, I'm gonna correct is now meeting on the 15th at three o'clock, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, other than that, we have meetings virtually of every committee this week, either on the 15th or the 14th. Um, we um, also encourage you to look at the town calendar on our website. There's no hearings tonight. Even though it's a special town council meeting, we are entertaining public comment. And this is the only public comment period. So I'd like for anybody who is in the town room, and we have one person visiting with us tonight, um, and he has signed up to make public comment. So if you are in the audience and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand now. So if you're in the audience and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand now. Seeing no hands in the audience, I'm going to turn to the, I'm sorry, on Zoom, I'm sorry. Seeing no hands on Zoom, I'm going to turn to the town clerk who will introduce our first and only commenter. Sandy Mosprat, you can come to the microphone. Please say your name and your address before you begin making your comment. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sandy Mosprat, 38 North Prospect Street. Uh, uh, and as an individual and secondarily as governor of a group concerned with climate action uh, centered on Great Grace Episcopal Church, your neighbors. Yeah. Councillors, manager. 
so this concerns the council's guidance uh, on priorities to the town manager for 2023-24. Uh, and I see that the draft of a resolution is at the end of this agenda. Now I'm pleased to see that the modifications of that guidance for 2023 retains action on climate change as the first uh, listed priority. Yet the expression of this, this guidance is considerably less specific than that given for 2022. You've just got to see the redactions on the first draft. This is unwise. The urgency of the need for action on climate change demands that action to be completed in short order. The guidance should express that urgency and that assessment and that the assessment of the performance of town officials is contingent upon real specific progress. Some actions that may be specified have been extensively schematized, defined, studied and reported on in the climate action adaption and resilience plan uh, of June 2021, the annual report to the Energy and Climate Action Committee, the recent me memos, August on um, refuse collection uh, and community aggregation. There is no want of data. One can act. What is needed is the bite to take, make it happen. Now, one recognizes that there are pressing demands on the limited resources available to the town to meet those demands but the underlying reality is that all plans will be vain unless the progress to address climate change is rapid, effective to the point of being disruptive, and doubtless, I regret, at the expense of other treasured objectives. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Seeing that we have no other public comment, I am going to um, state there is no consent agenda tonight. And while the resolution and proclamation is the next item on our agenda, in deference to the fact that Shalini Balmilm is planning to join us, but is told me she would be late because she has to cut another meeting short. I'm going to go on to the action items and the action items in this case the first one is the proposed amendments to zoning bylaws, article bylaw article three, use regulations, article five, accessory uses, article 11, administration and enforcement, and article 12 definitions. This is a first reading, so there'll be no vote tonight. Uh, and we're joining us for a brief presentation um, is planning director Chris Restrup and planner Nate Malloy. I just want to let you know your camera is off, Lynn. Oh, I don't mean it mean for it to be off at all. Sorry. Thank you. Here I am. Sorry. Chris, you have your hand up. I just wanted to say that Nate Malloy is prepared to give a brief presentation and then we'll both be here to answer questions. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, thanks everyone. I'm Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. And should I go with this, uh, Athena, sharing the screen, or should I share my own screen? What's easier? We I'll, have the presentation. I'll let you go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Athena. Sure, okay. just to go ahead, Nate. Yep. The um, so this is updating food and drink establishment in the zoning bylaw. And you know, it's a specific category in the use chart that then had some ripple effects. Uh, that also um, we have changes to three other sections in the zoning bylaw. So um, it really is just food and drink. Um, we're reclassifying that section 3.352, uh, something staff had talked about previously. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, we realized that Article 14, temporary zoning, um, taught us some lessons that we could administer this and make changes. So we could see what's actually happening on the ground and we could incorporate conditions into the zoning bylaw to make it easier for staff, applicants, and permitting boards. Um, I'll skip this. Um, you know, just quickly, this is something to help businesses um, stay in Amherst, expand, and also attract businesses to Amherst. And so, currently, a lot of um, food and drink establishments are permitted by special permit. That's a discretionary permit. Um, and businesses, if they see that, they may not even come to town because in other communities, special permits are often denied. In Amherst, we work with applicants. So even if we tell them that, that you know, we'll try to get you to the finish line uh, with conditions, 
it will be approved, they often don't want to go through that process. So part of this purpose was to um, have those impactful uses remain special permit uses, but have other food and drink establishments by site plan review. Uh, still a public hearing through the planning board. Uh, through Article 14, um, in the past two years, about 20 or more food and drink establishments had some type of permit. That's through administrative approval with the building commissioner. There was a decision written, uh, plans, it's on file with the town clerk and in the town hall, but it didn't go to, an S to a public hearing through the planning board or zoning board. So the Drake opened under Article 14. Uh, the spoke expanded uh, to cover that whole building. It almost doubled in space. Um, and Garcia is also opened. And so these things happen through Article 14, incorporating 20 years worth of conditions that the ZBA um, had learned from. So food and drink had last been updated in the 80s and then in the 2000s and now now. So about every 20 years, uh, it seems like food and drink gets updated. And we've learned that, um, you know, each 20 years, the conditions to put in the bylaw to make it smoother and, uh, you know, be more enforceable. Where we're talking about this occurring are um, the village center. So five zoning districts, the, the downtown uh, BG, uh, general business and limited business, and then the business village center, um, the commercial and neighborhood business. And so it's those areas highlighted in red and hatching um, on this map. So really it's a limited area where this zoning change will take effect. And this is kind of the, the major change to that use chart. Right now there's three um, existing permits or, or classifications that are permitted, class one, class two, and class three. And we're proposing four. So um, a restaurant, cafe, bar with food or other similar uh, establishment would be site plan review or administrative approval. A bar with no food, uh, that's a special permit. A nightclub would be a special permit. And an establishment with more than 200 patrons that's both inside and outside would be by special permit. And a bar with no food could be a restaurant that after hours closes their kitchen and then just serves mainly alcohol. And so that type of establishment would be by site plan review for the restaurant operation and then be required to get a special permit when it would be converted to a bar. So there could be two permits on that establishment if that's how they wanted to operate. And just quickly, uh, you know, how existing restaurants or establishments would fit in with this categorization. Um, you know, Johnny's Tavern uh, has about 175 um, capacity, occupant capacity, and that would be by site plan review. Uh, Pita Pockets is on the smaller side with 21 um, capacity, and that's site plan review. A bar with no food is Moan and Dove. So prepackaged food like peanuts or pretzels um, doesn't you know make it a restaurant it's still a bar and you know Mona Dove has about 80, 80, 80 an occupant capacity of 80. Um, we have a few nightclubs in town one is Hazel's Blue Lagoon and then a larger establishment is like the hangar in ABC so that's almost 400 uh, capacity and so those are the classifications and how existing restaurants would fit in and so although we're changing just that article 3 use classification uh, that also impacted Article 5, accessory uses, because that also um, regulated outdoor dining and music at these establishments. Article 11 uh, for administrative approval, when there's minor changes, and then Article 12. And so I'm not sure if counselors would like me to show those articles just to get a sense for that. I'll go through it quickly. We're proposing a whole new use chart, um, that 3.352, I can zoom in, but here's what it would look like. The four uses are listed here by site plan review and special permit. And really what um, is important is that there's 11 new conditions, uh, standards and conditions in the bylaw. And these are a summary of really what's been learned over the last 20 years and through article 14. And so, you know, as applicable, any establishment would be subject to review and approval by the board of licensing commissioner. Um, so if, a, if an establishment would like to serve alcohol, they still have to apply to the Board of Licensing Commissioners, even if they're a site plan review. And that board holds a separate public hearing and can also place conditions on an establishment. Uh, there's other state and local codes that would regulate that. Uh, we're putting in here 
Uh, number three, that they have to comply with any uh, accessory use regulations. So that's article five. That they'll um, operate and be maintained by a set of um, plans in number four. And so this is something that we started with um, in article 14 requiring even for administrative approval. And it is, it's more extensive than what is currently required. So a site plan, a floor plan, a layout plan, uh, patron management plan, a general management plan, um, parking plan, and traffic impact statement. So, you know, this looks to me, this is like a um, you know, kind of like a recipe, and it's telling the applicant and staff what to look for in an application. So, we're asking an applicant to provide all of this information. Um, number five lists all the information we'd like to see in a management plan. So, hours of operation, uh, specific strategies if alcohol is served, such as um, queuing and patron le patrons leaving the establishment, uh, signs, lighting, noise, deliveries, employee parking. So all of this information would have to be completed by an applicant. And then that can be turned into a condition that then becomes enforceable by the town. Um, you know, electronic ID verification, if, if applicable, um, on-site trainings and current certifications, uh, you know, reuse reusable tableware, um, and that the area be clean daily. Outdoor furniture shall be placed so it meets clearance and egress requirements. We're proposing to modify condition 10. This is the only existing piece remaining that in the BN district, there should be no more than a total of 50 seats indoor and outdoors for an establishment. And that service of alcohol will cease at 9 p.m. Um, there are more conditions placed in article five for the BN district. And a new one, which is something that has been the practice of the zoning board and the board of licensing commissioners is number 11, and that is there shall be no alcohol service after 1 a.m. And so there are some establishments that have existing special permits that may allow them to serve after 1 a.m., but any uh, recent or you know, proposed uses, if this were to pass, uh, 1 a.m. would be the end of alcohol service. That typically then uh, the board allows for an hour to close. So, you know. Alcohol stops at one, service stops at one, the place has to be cleaned up and closed by 2 a.m. In Article 5, sorry, I was. Article 5 regulates accessory uses. So um, it's uh, 5.041 and 5.042. And so in this section, uh, we allow outdoor seasonal dining. And the change in this one here is um, the strike through in red is currently it's only allowed if it's accessory to a restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, uh, number two, a bakery, deli, or other similar establishment selling food, and three, a retail store or convenience store selling prepared food. We're proposing to say that in these districts, the BGBL and those five district di districts I mentioned, that food and outdoor dining can be accessory to any principal use authorized in the use chart subject to the same review as it. So if it's a site plan review use, it's a site plan review hearing. If it's a special permit use, it's a special permit hearing to have outdoor dining. Uh, there was some discussion by the planning board and CRC about, well, that means, you know, a gas station could sell food. And in our bylaw, we say it has to be customarily um, accessory in the county and in the region. And it really has to be accessory to the principal use. So you know, there is now food being sold at gas stations, uh, you know, um, but it couldn't be something where it's a separate business. It really has to be related to the primary use. And that's an, the applicant has to prove that to the town. We're also proposing here that in the BN district, any outdoor dining shall be located no closer than 100 feet to any residential dwelling in a residential district. And um, there was part of the condition that was removed in the use chart and we're putting it here we're reframing it a little bit um, just so that, you know, right now uh, in the BN district, we say that a food and drink establishment couldn't be located 100 feet building to building, which really eliminates any use in the BN district for food and drink. Um, so we're removing that condition and we're saying really that the outdoor piece needs to be 100 feet away. In the subsequent bullets of 5.041, um, we're and uh, this first one here, right now we're saying that the accessory dining, sorry, it keeps jumping on me, is um, has to be closed between November 1 and April 1. And we're saying, we're proposing to have that be removed and to say that outdoor dining 
shall be allowed so long as the accessory use is active and operational. So if someone wants to stay open during the winter and maintain it and clean it, we're saying that's fine. Um, currently, that wouldn't be the case. They would have to close down. In 5.0413, we're eliminating, proposing to eliminate the statement that um, there's freestanding heating and cooling devices. So during the pandemic, we actually had outdoor heating and it seemed to work really well. So we're proposing to strike that. For live and pre recorded music, um, same thing. We're proposing to say that it can be accessory to any use in Section 3, although in the BN district, there shall be no entertainment outside the building. So that's uh, in the bold italics. Um, so live and pre recorded entertainment, again, it has to be clearly accessory to the use. Uh, and it's something that would go through the same permitting as the use. Um, and then in 5.043, we're deleting the drive-in drive restaurant because that's proposed to be eliminated as a use classification. And then Article 11 is really where um, there is some discussion about what it means to have administrative approval. And so existing in the bylaw is an administration um, in 11.21, we're changing administration and applicability. And so currently the planning board doesn't see a lot of restaurant applications. And that's because in 11.21, which we see here, site plan review shall not be required when, and there's 11.2110, uh, these conditions here. These are proposed to be renumbered. That's why there's some bold italics and some red, but really these conditions are already in the bylaw. So if there's no exterior change to a building or site, then there's no site plan review essentially it can be approved by the building commissioner. Um, if there's only changes to the signs, then it doesn't go to a hearing, it goes to the building commissioner. If there's um, a small change and the building commissioner determines it doesn't conflict with the bylaw, it's administratively approved. The, um, and so that's not new. What is new is the ability now we're proposing that in administrative approval 11.212 here is what the building commissioner can now, and I don't know why it keeps jumping on me, uh, can make this decision and then file it with the town clerk like in article 14. And so right now there's no written decision. If there's administrative approval, it's something that happens between the town and the applicant. What, we're, what we learned from article 14 is if we can have the building commissioner approve it, deny it, or approve it with conditions, it's a lot more effective to be enforced and it can also be changed. And so uh, this is really the a key part is that if the building commissioner approves an administrative approval with conditions, at any time that those conditions can be reviewed and the, and the permit could be changed or it could be revoked or there could be enforcement actions. And so it gives the town the ability to really monitor um, establishments that have administrative approval. And so there was some concern initially that administrative approval meant that an applicant would not have any conditions associated with it, but it still has to meet all those pr proposed conditions in the bylaw. And there also has to be the submittal of all those plans that are required. And then there's also a written decision that's kept on record. And so, um, you know, this is really tightening up and making administrative approval a lot stronger than it currently is now. The last changes are to Article 12. And just quickly, we um, are proposing to change um, language in bar. We have a definition for, a definition for bar where the food and drink establishment uh, is devoted primarily to the service and consumption of alcohol. And we're saying it may, and food may be incidental as opposed to is only incidental. And then we're proposing to remove, uh, there's a definition for a drive up restaurant. And so uh, that was never really a definition that was used and now it would be just considered a restaurant. And so we we're proposing to delete that and then really just renumber the remaining section of definitions in article 12. And so I guess that's a quick summary of the food and drink establishment. Can um, you please convey to us the planning board voted uh, for on this and what was their vote? Right, so the planning board uh, met a few times and um, when they voted, they voted the all um, changes at once 
So the changes to the use chart, Article 5, Article 11, and Article 12. And the vote was five in favor and one abstention. And the one abstention um, uh, voiced the support of, of all of them. They wanted to have a little bit more time to uh, look at Article 5 and maybe change some wording. But, you know, they because it was every, um, you know, it was a, an article a vote that included all articles they you know they abstained from from the vote so it was you know five in favor and one abstention okay and uh chris do you have anything you want to add to this at this point no thank you i think nate did a great job of describing what's being proposed yes thank you uh mandy joe this came to crc and you spent some time on it yep crc voted ultimately voted unanimously to recommend all the changes. Our initial vote had some requested changes to that article, um, to that one condition that dealt with the BN neighborhood, and those were subsequently changed um, so that we could get it to GOL, and then we reaffirmed our unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Michelle? Yes, uh, GOL declared um, this clear, consistent, and actionable unanimously. Okay. Are there council questions? Kathy? Uh, I think my questions are pretty simple. Um, the first is when you do definitions, you kind of defined everything except cafe. Um, and cafe is then referred to later. And uh, a suggestion would be when you're defining a restaurant, say restaurant or, or cafe, since they're probably the same things, but it made me think is what is a cafe if it's not a restaurant since later on in the use table. Um, then my... Um, the list, Nate, that you had that goes with the dimensions table and then that long list, what wasn't clear to me is how much of that is the Board of License is doing that now or would be doing some of those versus the planning borders. This is just the first time a brand new place opens up because it's so detailed. It seemed like you just you really want to have a plan to run the place, um, oversee it. Um, it didn't seem like the kind of thing that the planning board would normally do um, as opposed to license. So that's kind of a question on how they interact. And then I'll give my my third. I'm not quite sure I, you gave that big map of where these places are that it can be. If you are up in North Amherst and you get to Coles Road where we have uh, restaurants and is that um, a village center business? Do we have a weird, and, and so it's a question of the, the other boundaries that we've got that showed up as quite odd in some places, like what, where does uh, residential vill village center leave off from village center business? And North Amherst was one of the places where House of Teriyaki kind of makes it in, even though across the street doesn't or, you know, so it's, do we need to revisit those at some point or is everything fine in terms of where a restaurant, a cafe, a pizza place, uh, now we have a rest, uh, breakfast place can be. So those are my three. First is simple, just put cafe somewhere. And then the other is this detailed list. Um, Andy, do you wanna build on those questions before we ask for a response? My question is different, but if you'd like me to pose it now, I can. Please do. Yeah, my question was about the change in definition of a bar that um, no longer requires um, service of food. And uh, there's quite a history to that because the reason that that was in there was concern about alcohol consumption without food um, leading to a greater risk of the effect of alcohol not being uh, tempered by actual food and uh, concerns about driving after leaving the establishment and those associated kinds of things. And I was wondering if there'd been any discussion about it and whether there'd been any consultation with uh, people in public safety or public health regarding that particular change. Okay, so I'm going to go back to uh, Chris and Nate and uh, begin to respond to those questions. Sure. So I'll go in the order they were asked. The uh, the definitions or the list of restaurant, cafe, and the use chart 
Um, you know, I've, in the currently there really is a restaurant. You're right. Uh, some of it is just for um, you know information. The way our bylaw is structured is that if there is a proposed use and it doesn't fit within the use chart, the building commissioner has to figure out what where to put it. How what is the closest use category? And so by having that list in the use chart, you know, someone may come in and say, "Well, I'm really not a restaurant. I'm a cafe." and and so really it's to help guide an applicant and the building commissioner to put that use there. And so, um, you know, before we had listed other things, we said like a lunchroom or cafeteria, and those were never defined terms in the bylaw either. And so really, you know, what's proposed uh, restaurant, cafe, bar with food is really, um, you know, those types of, those are similar uses. And so, you know, whether or not we leave it or drop it, it's still the same uh, meaning. And, you know, the building commissioner would help have an applicant uh, figure out where they are, you know, where they would fit in the use chart. Um, and then in terms of North Amherst, we're not let proposing- me, Let me change. just yeah. pause for a moment. Kathy, you wanted to pursue that definition. Uh, yeah, um, you know, Nate, in the basic use chart, they're lumped together and then in definitions there, it's not mentioned was what I was pointing out, but, but we, I don't think we have any examples in Amherst, but you get a lot in some urban areas where a bookstore has a little nook that serves uh, food. Um, it's a bookstore, but it has food. And then is it is that a cafe? Is that a restaurant? Or is that a bookstore with a restaurant in it? And so, so just I, I, you're trying to clean up complications, so I'm not trying to complicate it more. I just want to make sure when we define what a restaurant is, it implies it's a freestanding entity that's a restaurant as opposed to embedded in something else. So just look at those words later to make sure you capture all possibilities. So that, but that was my only point that sometimes cafes just are kind of smaller in their nooks rather than a freestanding. Thank you, sure. Nate. Please so continue. yeah, we do have a definition for restaurant in the bylaw. And so really if it's an establishment with a separate kitchen, that needs review by the Board of Health and other things, that becomes a second use. And so that could either be an accessory use or a second principal use. So, you know, if there's a bookstore that then wants to serve food, you know, it comes down to, is it prepackaged and it's delivered from somewhere else and they're just distributing it? Or are they actually making it and having, you know, something there and it wouldn't be, um, so, you know, we would fit it in as possibly, um, like I said, a second principal use that would need permitting and review and, you know, all the certificates and licensing or something else. And so it wouldn't just be, oh, the bookstore could now start making, you know, sandwiches and, and having someone buy them. We'd have to have it fit a use classification. Um, and so for, for North Amherst, right. So where the house of Teriyaki is south of the intersection, that is a zoning district that allows food and drink establishments. And then North um, of the intersection in North Amherst, there's a large commercial district between Sunderland Road and Montague Road, we're not proposing to change any zoning districts. So currently in those districts that I mentioned, the food and drink establishments are allowed and we're just changing the classifications of those. We're not changing where they are allowed. And so if in the future, uh, someone thinks that, you know, the business village center zoning district in some areas needs to be rezoned and moved, that's not what we're proposing here. So we're not moving zoning district boundaries. We're just changing the use classifications for food and drink establishments. Um, and then, Kathy, your third question, I'm forgetting. It's it's in the complicated dimensions table. We're now at the bottom. Yes. You have a lot of conditions around restaurants that look like it would be also part of the licensure review. Right. So these conditions, right. So no, these conditions in the bylaw right here, uh, the 1 through 11, would be either the planning board, if it's site plan review, the zoning board, if it's a special permit, or the building commissioner. And so the board of licensing commissioners is really focused on um, the management of alcohol service uh, and serve, you know, and what and around that. So the board of licensing commissioners could put conditions on an establishment as it's related to the service and management of alcohol, but they wouldn't necessarily follow these other conditions right here. So these are conditions in the zoning bylaw that would be used by, you know, um, land use boards or staff. And so the Board of Licensing Commissioners may have similar um, concerns in terms of say management strategy, uh, in terms of queuing or alcohol service as what we have in our management plan. 
but they wouldn't necessarily follow these conditions in their, in their review or public hearing. They have their own set of guidelines. Okay, and on to Andy's question. On to Andy's, yeah, so right now Amherst allows a bar um, with, through a site plan review. So oftentimes what happens is a restaurant will come into town, they'll say they'll serve food and they'll close early. And that's a class one, they're allowed through site plan review. And then three months later, they decide they wanna stay open until two o'clock or one o'clock, close their kitchen at 10. And for the last three hours of operation be a bar. And then that becomes a class two restaurant. It's a special permit from the ZBA. And this happens all the time. We notice it, it goes through the public hearing very rarely do any public come. And because the establishment is already operational, they may have been running for six months, there's been no complaints. The ZBA grants the permit and now they're a bar after hours with no food. And that's been happening for 20 years. It happened before that too uh, in the 90s. And so there's always been bars with uh, no kitchen, right? So the definition of a bar is where um, the primary is service is the primary consumption of alcohol. We're not changing that definition. That's always been in the bylaw and we're not proposing to change that. We're saying that the service of food may be incidental and is not only incidental. So it's just that language instead of only incidental is that it may be incidental. And so, um, you know, that's been 20 years where there's been bars open later and they can still serve food. They could serve prepackaged food or if they wanna keep their kitchen open uh, even now, they would be considered um, a bar, but they have a kitchen or in the proposed language, they would still be a restaurant. So a restaurant, if their kitchen is gonna stay open and they're gonna staff it and have their full kitchen and serve food until 11 or midnight, then it, that, that, that is a restaurant or a bar with food. Um, and so we're not proposing to change how um, you know, a bar operates or the definition. So that's something that has been happening, like I said, for the last um, 20 years. Uh, since the changes were made in you know the early 2000s. Okay, Andy, questions to follow up on that? You know, the only follow up I'd have is just to point out that there had been, I can recall, discussions um, when the select board was the license commissioners about questions of some bars, including the one that you named as an example, that were not selling food at any time and whether that was acceptable and whether that was wise policy. And that's why I brought the issue up. Okay. Sure, so you know, a bar with no food is a special permit, proposed to be a special permit use. And so if there is one proposed, it's a discretionary permit through the ZBA. And really it's because there could be some more impacts for that use. And so. Like I said, currently someone comes in and they kind of game the system because they get a site plan review and then they change it a few months later, three, six months later, a year later, and then they become a class two restaurant with a special permit. Um, but now if someone comes in, they would need a special permit as a bar with no food, you know, from the outset. And so, you know, a, a nightclub or a larger establishment we're proposing to be special permit uses. So it still has, you know, a, a special hearing, a public hearing through the zoning board um, associated with it. Christine? I just wanted to point out that um, the, the Board of License um, Commissioners has taken over the role of the select board in the granting of liquor licenses. And so the Board of License Commissioners looks at whether an establishment should have some food available. And that would be, you know, it might be as minimal as popcorn or pretzels or peanuts or something like that. But they would decide whether there should be some form of food. And I think in, nor in normal conditions, they do require that something be available, but it's not food that's served from a full kitchen. It's food that is somehow prepackaged or just a very minor amount. And Rob Mora is here in, um, uh, in the attendees. And so if you wanted to hear from him about that topic, he, he would be available to, um, to talk to you about that. But that's my understanding. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the council? This is the first reading. There's a significant amount of material in your packet. Nate, thank you for the abbreviated presentation. Um, we will do the second reading next week on the 19th. And Pam, you have a question. A more of a comment. Mm -hmm. um, we did study this at some length in the CRC and went back and forth with the planning department as well, who were very helpful in 
sort of laying out the um, sort of the full exposure. One of my one of my original concerns was that in fact we were it seemed that we were losing the opportunity to uh, to notify abutters when um, we lost the classifications of the restaurants from uh, based on operating hours and service of alcohol. And with uh, a, a fuller vetting of this conversation with planning department, um, I was able to finally support this because I learned in the process that in fact, as just mentioned, Board of Licensing Commissioners will step in and hold public hearings, notify abutters for two reasons. One, if there is a change in in hours of operation, which obviously affects neighbors and any change in service of alcohol and their approach to that, which obviously again affects neighbors. So I'm pretty comfortable that um, Board of License Commissioners, as well as the, the special permits for many of these uses um, will be a safeguard that we need. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions from counselors? Um, just a housekeeping issue. Shalini, can you hear us? Yes. And the records should show that Shalini joined us about 648, okay? Um, since we've started and we already delayed our staff from a week ago, I think we owe them the privilege of moving right on to the proposed revisions to zoning bylaw article two, uh, zoning districts, article three, use regulations, article 16, FEMA flood map, floodplain overlay district, zoning bylaw, official zoning map, FEMA floodplain insurance study dated February 9th, 2023. This is a first reading, but it's not the first time that it's come to the council. This has come to the council on various stages throughout um, the process. This has been shepherded by Chris and her staff and is done, I believe, every 10 years. And so um, we assume that there's a, a material in the um, packet is something that you've reviewed as counselors. And so with that, we're going to move right to uh, the question the planning board's recommendation or report on this with regard to their vote. Chris, please. Um, on November 2nd, the planning board voted six to zero with one member absent to recommend to town council to adopt the zoning amendments um, to articles two, three, and to add article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district and to recommend that town council adopt the amendment to the official zoning map to add the FEMA floodplain overlay district. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mandy Jo, CRC. So CRC's vote was more extensive, but we did vote unanimously on four different things. Um, two were the same as the planning board, which dealt with the zoning bylaws. So we voted unanimously to recommend the council adopt all those proposed revisions Chris just mentioned to the zoning map and to the actual zoning bylaw. We also voted um, to recommend that the town council adopt the flood insurance rate maps, which are the firm maps. Those are the same maps that the overlay district amendments to the zoning map would be, but we have to adopt them separately as firm maps too under the FEMA protocols. And we also recommended that the town council adopt the flood insurance rate study dated February 9th, 2023. And when you read these things, including the zoning bylaw that has a date of February 9th, 2023, that is not a mistake. They cannot go into effect until that six month window closes from the date we got the letter. So yes, these are dated ahead of when we'll be voting. Um, but those are four actions we have to take two related to the zoning, well, there's a lot of zoning, but then these two extra ones about adopting the flood insurance rate maps and the actual study, which is a big long document. And then CRC, well, actually it was GOL that recommended. So I won't talk about that um, in terms of the effective date. That was GOL. Okay. Michelle, GOL. 
You're going to make me remember that right now. <laughs> Aren't you, Mandy? I might need help. Um, we did we did vote for this to be uh, declared clear, consistent, and actionable. And I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the date. Uh, we, Mandy, you would do better to describe. I remember the conversation, but if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. So, because the zoning bylaws and these studies are dated February 9th, 2023, GOL's recommendation was to adopt these effective that same date. Okay. And I think Nate um, had a good reasoning for that, and, and and we had that discussion. Am I right about that, Nate? You you had, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Are there questions from the council? I just want to be very sure that the lack of questions does not mean that people haven't engaged in this. In fact, there's been a ton of engagement in this over the last year. And both of these measures or areas that we've looked at tonight uh, really come as a result of enormous work on uh, the part of our planning staff and the part of our committees, the planning board, as well as the town council committees. Mandy Jo? You did what I always forget to do that I raised my hand to do, which is to thank Chris and the entire planning staff, especially for the flood mapping project. They've been working on it for over a decade. And so this is a long time coming. And thank you for all your work on that. But but the planning staff and also Rob Moore on food and drinks, too, because that the temporary zoning is sunsetting in about two and a half weeks. So they they worked hard to be able to get us something so that we didn't have to renew that temporary zoning yet again. And it's also a wonder, the other piece, the um, earlier one that we did is a wonderful example of where we learned from Article 14. Um, Rob and his staff kept meticulous records. And then we're able to come back and say, and because of what we've learned, we're now going to propose these bylaw changes. And all of that started happening with COVID. So look at this as a good outcome from COVID. Kathy? Uh, thanks. I, I just want to echo the amount of work. And Chris, I remember you standing in town hall with all the flood maps around you as people were coming in, trying to find their piece of land and what happened because you were one-on-one -on -one uh, taking on questions, which was terrific. I have just a, I have a pretty narrow question. Um, assuming the elementary school moves forward, um, it would be moving um, forward starting the beginning of May. They're operating with the old flood maps right now because they were told to keep that until they're posted. Um, to what extent would that mean they have to go before the Conservation Commission more than once. Um, if in, in this particular piece of land, the, the floodplain has moved back a little, it's not moved closer to the school, you know, so they had both lines. So would it, it it's a it's a timing, it's just a timing issue of um, and they've gotten pretty clear instructions from Aaron Jack, Eric Jack to stay with current map because it's more restrictive, you know, in terms of delineation. Chris. So that's what we've been told by our um, consultant uh, who gets their information from FEMA, that we should use the more um, restrictive maps until the new maps are adopted. And that's the um, <clears throat> rubric that I would operate under. And um, if you wanted to have a more you know, intensive conversation about that, I suggest talking to Erin Jock, but it sounds like you've already spoken with her. So that's the guidance that we've been given, which is to use the more restrictive maps until the new ones are adopted. Okay. Uh, Nate? Sure, thanks. Yeah, just one other piece. There was a meeting um, a while ago with you know the school team and you know the, the information for these maps has been available for quite some time. So the you know the consultants for the school project have the new flood maps, they have the elevations. And so we discussed that. So although through permitting, they have to use the more restrictive maps, they have the elevation data and the flood data for the new maps. And so, you know, they, they're they aware of what those flood elevations are. And so, you know, they can, you know, they, they so they can essentially plan accordingly, right? So even if they have to go through the Conservation Commission using more restrictive maps, they have the flood elevations that are, you know, will be part of the new map 
um, you know, they have knowledge of that. So. Thank you. That that was my understanding. I just didn't want them to have to go twice, and because it's they're operating under the more restrictive. Um, that's they they have both sets. They have um, a lot of information on on this planning. So thank you. Are there other questions or comments from the council, Anika? Oh yes, I have a well. Thank you as well. And just a quick comment. Um, I really appreciate how within all of this work that you've done, you've made room for establishments who are able to expand upon um, outdoor um, dining and um, moving those dates. I think one of um, the ideas that we've really seen through COVID is it's allowed people to really be creative in how they uh, organize um, the ability for people to be outside and um, dine. And though we're Moving on, we're still moving in on to winter, so I think that will be incredibly, you know, helpful for um, residents and um, establishment owners at the same time. So thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Well, again, Chris, Nate, and Rob, thank you for joining us. You're getting out of here by 7.30. I just want to note that time since we kept you here till I think 10 la last time or 11. And uh, so I'm glad we could um, take you first and have you join us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're going to now go back to the... proclamation or the resolution, excuse me. Uh, we had a resolution before us last week. It was a resolution concerning the safety of the Amherst Pelham Regional High School Athletic Complex. And um, that resolution had two friendly amendments in it and those that is posted. Since then, uh, the sponsor of this has also consulted with some other people and there is now a substitute motion or resolution in your packet. I'd like to take you to take just a moment to make sure you're looking at the right one. Um, and Athena, you might want to put the new one while I turn to Michelle Miller to make a motion to substitute, if you will. Point of order. Yes. Can someone describe exactly which document is the new one? Well, but in our packet. It's the one that was posted around four o'clock. And Dorothy, you have your hand up. You need to unmute Dorothy. I read this and I was quite surprised because I didn't see that this added anything. It does not. Um, say any action it, it the only thing new is it says we have listened to the Amherst Board of Health but it doesn't sound like we are saying we will follow the Amherst Board of Health's advice and I know that there has been there's uh, not all scientists agree but since most of them do and most health organizations do agree that PFAS is dangerous to all and particularly to young people um this doesn't include any of the discussion as to once you get something with PFAS in it, what do you do when you have to get rid of it and dispose of it, or how do you take care of it and what the equipment is. So I am very unhappy with this. I don't see this as anything that I could support. And that is why I'm just, I'm not, what, what, all it says is we listen to the Board of Health, but doesn't say we're going to follow their advice. So it seems to have no teeth at all and to be just basically, here's your $900,000. So I'm very unhappy with it. Okay. Michelle, would you like to make your motion? Yeah, just a process question, Lynn. I, I will make the motion, but I would like to be able to give a little bit of framework about this and how this came yes. to be. We, we do that after you make the okay. motion. And it's perfect. Been so okay. there is a motion on the floor. That motion was to adopt... I'm sorry, let me just make sure I have the right. It's to, that motion on the floor was to adopt the resolution concerning the safety of Amherst Pelham Regional High School Athletic Complex as presented 
that motion was made by me and it was seconded by Michelle. And then we delayed this until the next time we met. So if you are going to place this new or replacement or amended resolution on the table, you need to make that motion and it needs to be seconded. Okay, so I am making a motion to replace the previously proposed motion or resolution concerning the safety of the Amherst Pelham Regional High School Athletic Complex on December 5th with the newly proposed resolution or resolution concerning the safety of the Amherst Pelham Regional High School Athletic Complex uh, that you have here. I, that might not have been the best motion, but that's the best I could do at the moment. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. Athena, I just want to make sure we're now going to be dealing with the substitute motion. And is that how we're going to refer to it in this? Okay. So, um, Michelle, please go ahead. Sure. Um, so, last week I presented a motion that I felt was. Um, sort of a coupling with the action that we took to add option two to the appropriation order. And this motion or this this resolution was postponed and we we heard the reasons for the reason that uh, Councillor Ball Milne pro postponed it. Um, so Councillor Ball Milne, Sh Shalini and I um, were able to get together and talk about her concerns. Um, and it was uh, clear that also Mandy was um, having some similar concerns. So we decided that we would try to work together on a resolution that um, we hoped would address a couple things. And so that's what I really wanted to frame. Um, we went into our meeting to really try to get clear on what the intentions of the resolution were. And um, we wanted to stick to facts of record. Um, we wanted to stick to timelines that have been established. Um, we wanted to express our support for our students and our student athletes, as well as express our understanding that the uh, fields are in very poor condition. We also wanted to express the concerns brought up about artificial turf and PFAS and make some commitment to continuing to evaluate those concerns. Um, what we didn't want to do is get into a debate in this resolution about uh, the science or choosing um, a, a, a side in the resolution. We really worked hard to try to create a balanced resolution that acknowledged concerns um, and put on the record our support for our student athletes. However, I will say that. We also discussed in our meeting last week, um, and I think this was Andy's suggestion, uh, if the council wants to take a position or wants to provide some guidance to the regional school committee, um, then that's a discussion that this council should have. And perhaps there's some other um, measure or a letter that is written um, by our council president on behalf of the council to give the regional school committee direction. Um, but we felt that for this resolution doing that, this wasn't the right place to do that. Um, and I, Shalini and Mandy, if I've missed something, um, please feel free. Jennifer. Um, yeah, I just what if if the so the motion that is now on the table is this substitute resolution okay do yeah. you want to speak to this or is there an amendment you want to make or what i wanted to ask there were two uh paragraphs um in the original motion that were taken out that i i just that seemed 
to give it a little more substance, but didn't seem to be, I, I thought weren't controversial. And that, so looking at the first, the motion from last week, it's the first now therefore be it resolved. And then the final one be it further resolved. And that, I don't know if you want me to read both, but it's just one is, you know, you can refer to it. Um, last week it, in the original motion, which was just sponsored by Councillor Miller, um, the first it said, now therefore be it resolved that the Amherst Town Council encourages the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee to prioritize the remediation of the poor conditions of the high school athletic complex and in determining which option to pursue to consider among other benefits and drawbacks, the emerging science related to the health and environmental safety of PFAS and artificial turf. And then there were the second, be it further resolved that the Amherst Town Council supports federal and state legislation related to PFAS safety, including the soon to be signed into law PFAS Firefighter Protection Act and Bill S-1387, an act restricting toxic PFAS chemicals and consumer products to protect our health, sponsored by Massachusetts State Senator Joanne yeah. Comerford. And I just ask, are you making a motion that those be added in? Yeah, I think I'm asking why those were taken out. Yeah, 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 right. Um, Michelle or whomever. Yeah, I mean, so I just, again, I want to say that if we, if we as a council have an intention for this resolution, um, then maybe that's the discussion that we need to be having because um, it sounds to me like um, perhaps um, I'm hearing from Dorothy and maybe Jennifer that um, maybe we have different thoughts about what this resolution is meant to do. Um, but specifically to answer your questions, Jennifer, um, sorry, the starting with the uh, now therefore be it resolved um, that would that mention the other legislation, uh, we decided to remove that because it was not in relation to artificial turf. Um, and we included the language around legislation, future legislation, um, so that that sort of scaffolds and gives us an opportunity to, at another time, be able to come back and potentially um, consider legislation related to PFAS in our community. Um, can you... Go ahead. Sorry, Jennifer, look like you're about to say. I, I, I understand. <laughs> you know, I guess when I look at the new resolution, mm -hmm. it's it's weak. the second to last, whereas seems to be the only one not really just saying we support the field. So I understand, uh, you know, Councillor Pam's concern about that. And where mm -hmm. it does say the Board of Health and members of the public have expressed concern. I think the Board of Health at their meeting last week did more than just express concern. So I'm a little uncomfortable with that wording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kathy? I agree with what Dorothy's concerns were and what Jennifer is voicing, uh, but I would sum it up as this is a pretty weak resolution at this point. Um, so I'm not, I don't really want to spend a lot of time on it, I must say. I mean, it, it could pass and it doesn't say anything. Um, the other one uh, may have had sentences that people wanted to pull out. There is no doubt that PFAS is concern. There is some, there is debate around what's currently in artificial turf that people can buy and whether it is a concern I'm, and I'm going to so I'm just very so very clear we are not going to sit here tonight and I know I, I'm not Lena I'm just saying that the old resolution had the paragraph Jennifer just talked about that said we were sending a message that this should still be part of a conversation in the school district if we don't want to do that I'm not sure this resolution currently does much of anything, so I'm not going to oppose it. I I just um, usually our resolutions take a strong stand on something. Um, okay. So Here's I cannot. One. I understand exactly what happened to it. I'm just saying that now I feel it's weak enough and doesn't say enough that I'm not sure it's worth doing. I'm going to skip to Mandy Joe. 
Um, I, I just want to echo what Michelle said, when the three of us, Michelle, Shalini, and I got together, and I thank Michelle for being willing to talk and work through and all, one of the first things we did is we asked ourselves, what do we want this resolution to accomplish? And as Michelle said, I think that might be where some of the concern from some of the counselors today is, because we came and, and agreed amongst us that we wanted to accomplish a resolution that showed support for our student athletes and support for um, rehabbing our fields because they're in poor condition. And we also wanted a resolution that recognized the concerns that people have surrounding PFAS in this community, particularly as it relates to artificial turf, um, but that did not take a stand. If people want a resolution that takes a stand on PFAS in particular or addresses only PFAS. Um, that's a different resolution in at least my mind because the decision at least for a number of us on artificial turf versus natural or support one way or the other was not just based on PFAS. And so we were trying to avoid that particular controversy in writing this resolution by saying, you know, people have concerns with that, including those of us that support artificial turf have you know recognized the concerns around PFAS, but there are other things that go into our decision. And so um, I, I, so that meant that we recognized that the bills that were mentioned in the first, the original resolution really didn't relate to the safety of the athletic fields because none of them actually deal with athletic fields and PFAS. So they didn't seem to have a, a, a reason to be in a resolution that dealt with our athletic fields. Um, and the other one was uh, the removal of that one was more from my mind as a recognition that the school committee in some sense is an equal to us. They are elected just like we are. And so we need to be really careful when we um, talk about their roles and our roles. And some of us were just very uncomfortable with the way that wording was, that language was worded because they are elected just like we are, and they are elected by the people just like we are to make decisions related to stuff within their own um, okay. purview and their own thing. So that I'm, was one of the other reasons to remove that in favor of supporting the implementation of that working, that strategic plan for the athletic fields in general. I'm going to ask that if people want changes, they make them as motions to amend. And uh, at this point, Anna, you're the only person whose hand is up who has not spoken. So I'm going to call on you and then we're going to move to amendments if we want them. Oh boy. Uh, so I did raise the issue of the first now, therefore in the last meeting, because I was extremely uncomfortable with it. I feel the the one that you're referring to, Jennifer, it is inappropriate in my mind to follow a vote of the council where we added in and passed an amendment, which provided and in, in the school committee with a choice to make instead of us making that choice but and then to follow that by pressuring them regarding their decision that felt completely inappropriate to me on multiple levels because i also agree with what mandy just said that we should not be passing judgment or or passing pressure on to the school committee regarding their decision i think that they take their jobs very seriously and they don't really need our our um, opinions and and trying to push a scale so that was something that I had raised in the last meeting um, that I was extremely uncomfortable with. And um, for me, that was one of the reasons I couldn't support the last resolution. Um, I also want to just note resolutions are non-binding. They indicate our support and our opinions, um, and they don't need to pass unanimously, but they shouldn't necessarily have teeth in the sense that they should not dictate they are not policy. They are non-binding resolutions. They are opinions of the council. And this resolution is demonstrating that the opinion of the council is that we support our student athletes and want to see our athletic facilities represent the amount of pride that we have in them. Um, so I, I appreciate the edits that were made and I thank the sponsors for their work. Dorothy, we're back to you. Yes, I will do a resolution. First of all, yes, a vote is stronger than a resolution. And we had a vote and the vote said, do not go ahead with PFAS. 
Secondly, we had a chance to redo, somebody said we had to redo the vote because we had new information. What was that new information? It was a letter from the superintendent of schools saying, please, if you don't like this, commit to grass fields, commit to making more fields, commit to what we need. I was totally prepared to support that since you brought it up and, and voided our vote, I wanted to support the superintendent's new information. Since then, just games upon games. So I'm saying that I would like to make a, 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 a motion that we support the superintendent's plan, request, that we support There's, the grass fields. Dorothy, that we're, there is a motion on the floor and there's an amendment to the motion on the floor. We're only dealing with those two at this time. Fine. I just am really getting tired of the games that are being played. So this isn't a game. This we is have called a chance. Robert's Rules of Order. Yeah. Well, you know what? This calling a new vote on new information and then ignoring the new information to me that's a game. Okay. The motion's on the floor. The motion's been am amended, and that amendment is on the floor. The amendment is a substitute resolution. Are there any further questions, comments, or requests with regard to the substitute resolution? Jennifer. Well, I guess I, mean, I thought that the reason we were having a resolution was to say we are, we support our athletes. And we can, we want to give, we are going to give this gift of free cash. Oh, can you hear me? Um, to the school committee. And we would, you know, like them to, can, to have the option for option two, which would be grass. It wouldn't just be tied to option three. And that the resolution was stating that we do have concerns about artificial turf. And it is the decision of the regional school committee, but kind of restating what that we had concerns and that we would like, you know, option two to remain an option, that that was really the point of the resolution that we, it is up to the school committee, but since we are giving this gift, we can express that we would like them to consider, you know, option two as well as three. So there was a reason for having the resolution. We clearly support our student athletes by the three appropriations that we've made for new fields. Um, you know, I, I agree it's, it's more perhaps um, symbolic. So I'm not, this isn't the hill I'm gonna die on. My, I think one concern, I don't know if other people share it and I don't know how the board of health would feel by just saying that they've expressed concern because I, I do think they've they've done more than that. Michelle? Yeah, I guess I would just, um, I, I want to restate that we as a council can decide what kinds of actions we want to take. And so this does not stop this council from having additional discussions um, that do uh, potentially, if there's a majority of counselors who feel this way, some of the things that are being pointed out by Dorothy and Jennifer. Um, so if the council feels that there should be some position taken or there should be some direction that is given to the regional school committee, I think that we can still do that. Um, I, I mean, Lynn's the president of the council, but I'm just saying, I don't, I, I guess what I'm saying is there are multiple things that our council can do in any uh, one arena that we're working within. And so it doesn't mean that supporting this resolution means that we can't take other steps that this council would like to take. Um, and I just wanted to ask Jennifer, Jennifer, um, so you restated what you thought the resolution was hoping to do, and I was just wondering, um, everything that you restated is covered in the resolution, um, so I was wondering which part you felt wasn't established in the resolution, and if, you know, there's some amendment that 
perhaps could be considered. I also wanted to clarify, Dorothy, Dorothy, you had said that we voted last time with the amendment on the appropriation not to do artificial turf. Um, but I don't think that's what that vote said. Um, so I just wanted to clarify if we had a different understanding about that, perhaps. Or we are discussing the motion. That okay, fair enough, floor. fair enough. Yeah, so Jennifer, just wondering what um, what piece do you feel is missing from this that you had hoped to have in there? Yeah, no, I guess as I read it again, you because know, we got it late that, yeah, you do have either artificial turf or natural grass. So I feel comfortable mm -hmm. with that. I just... Um, Yes, I was expressing, I, I thought that the two paragraphs, you know, I, I preferred the first resolution, but that's, you know, that the two paragraphs that came out, um, I think it's stronger with them back in. Mm -hmm. But as I said, if that's, um, and I, I guess I did honestly think that the last paragraph of the first resolution where you had mentioned legislation that we supported, mm -hmm. I thought that was part of the conversation was acknowledging that the council's role is legislative um, and that, you know, so that would be appropriate for us to voice, you know, um, support, mm -hmm. but maybe that would, that requires a longer conversation for legislative action that we it would be within our purview if we wanted to look at restricting, you know, certain chemicals, PFAS, you know, as that would be um, installed in Amherst, you know, that that would be within our purview to look at taking legislative action. And that was, I guess, part of why I thought that that be it further resolved was, was how the first resolution concluded. Um, yeah. yeah. So. so I just wanted to respond to that and just say that I, I, from my perspective, adding in that the council will continue to explore this and perhaps take legislative action is stronger than including legislative action that's already there that's not related to the safety of our fields. It, it felt sort of out of place, um, but I do think it's important um, that we are signaling in this resolution that there may be further action that's taken as this continues to be explored. And, um, you know, one of the things that I would hope is that we, the Board of Health and the Regional School Committee will um, continue to have discussions around the safety of artificial turf and PFAS, and perhaps even bring in folks um, to sit on a panel like other communities have done to explore this. But I, I just, I'm glad to, I, I just wanted to know which parts you felt had, you know, that you were hoping for had been removed. The way that we've worded it is a little bit different, like by saying that the $900,000 included artificial turf and um, natural grass is the way of saying, um, you know, that keep option two on the table wanted that included exactly. And so um, to, it is keeping that option on the table. Um, so that's it. Are there any other further comments or questions or proposed amendments? So we are going to first move on the substitute um, resolution. I'm looking at Athena. And if that passes, then we're finished. If it fails, we go back to the original resolution. Okay. Um, any other further questions or comments? It, Lynn, is this a vote? on whether to substitute or not, or is this a vote on the resolution? I just, I'm just asking what I'm voting on. It's a vote, the motion, Athena, go ahead. Um, it sounds like the intent of the motion was to uh, move to adopt a substitute it, resolution. Yeah. We, we're moving, we're moving directly to this. It's not like an amendment. It's okay. That's great. That, that's all I wanted to know. Thank yeah. you. I, I just wanted to make sure I was right in what I was doing. So the motion basically is to adopt the resolution concerning the safety of the Amherst Pelham Regional High School Athletic Complex as a substitute resolution. Or should it be to adopt the substitute resolution concerning? Well, 
I have to replace the previous motion adopting the resolution concerning the safety of the Amherst Pelham Regional High School Athletic Complex with the newly proposed resolution concerning the safety of the Amherst Pelham Regional High School Athletic, Com Athletic Complex submitted on December 12, 2022. I added the date to clarify that we're doing okay. the, new, the new draft. Thank you. Motion. Thank you for reading the motion that it, as it will appear at that motion was the motion that was made and seconded. Any further discussion? Shalini? I just, uh, oh, wow, that's really loud. Um, no, I just want to second what Michelle said and Mandy Joe. I just wanted to make sure, why is my voice sounding weird? Is it not, it sounds like echoing. We've had sound problems tonight. Just go ahead. Okay, please. okay. So I just wanted to make sure that Jennifer uh, got the part where we've added, it's the second last, be it further resolved that the MS Council supports the need to further investigate the impact of PFAS and all consumer products and continuing to learn the impact on new materials and artificial turf in our community and taking legislative action. I, I just wanted to make sure that you did see that. I know this was received very late. So I just wanted to make sure that you see that that's stated. And we felt that was stronger because it's talking about the legislative action we can take. And Joe Comerford's bill just talks about um, general consumer products and does not include athletic fields. So it didn't feel it was, um, that was another reason because her bill does not include athletic fields. It's only for consumer products. So, which is why we kind of removed that and kept it more pertaining to the athletic fields. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. We're gonna to move to the vote. Shalini Bowman. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. No. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. Abstain. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Uh, Alicia Walker. No. Uh, the way I have it is there's 10 in favor, there's two no's, and there's one abstention. So the substitute motion passes. Um, Michelle, we're going to go on to the next item. Yes, I'm just letting you know, my son just texted he's having a health issue. So I just need to um, turn my camera off for a second and return as soon as I can, okay? Thank you. Yep, thank you. So we should note that Michelle is not in the meeting starting at 7.57 um, and she'll return, okay? Um, so we are going to go to the next item on our agenda and uh, that is a proposed amendment to bylaw 3.22 discharging of firearms. This is a first reading. This is coming out of GOL. And um, is there someone else from GOL that can speak to this? Um, Andy Joe? I can try okay. unless our vice chair wants to, <laughs> if they're willing to pass it off. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this is part of GOL's review of the bylaw review committee's outstanding bylaws from four years ago that then got forwarded to the new council XYZ. And so here we are with at least one report out to you on this discharging of firearms. And so the bylaw review committee wanted the council to look at this to determine whether shotguns or air guns should be excluded from the provisions of the bylaw and clarify if fouling piece is different from shotgun and stuff like that. So we looked at the bylaw. We asked a lot of questions. We sent some questions off to the town attorney who got back to us and answered a lot of questions. And then we talked some more. And basically we um, voted uh, four to zero with one absent to recommend deleting section A1. And so A1 is um, 
the section that deals with um, shotguns and the exemptions to shotguns um, that that exempts shotguns from the paragraph at the very beginning. Um, so then shotguns would be subject to that very first paragraph um, that does that prevents the discharging of firearms in the town. Uh, that paragraph itself does not overrule any of the state laws, regulations, and laws related to the discharge of firearms. It gets really confusing, um, but that's the paragraph we're recommending be deleted. Okay. And that law bylaw is in your packet. It's been in your packet several times because we've delayed this vote. Um, so are there any questions from the council? This is a first reading. It will come back next week for the second reading and the vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Pam. I'll recognize you without your hand up on here. Can you just describe what excluding something means? And I mean, that sounds like a dumb question, but it's. So section A of the bylaw says that basically in Amherst, you can't discharge or fire a weapon. Firearm, gun, fouling piece. You just can't do that in Amherst. It's subject to whatever rules the state allows you to do. So it doesn't overrule. The state has rules allowing dis discharge of firearms more than I think 400 feet from a building and stuff like that. And so, um, so you can't overrule that. But so the A starts with not overruling that state law that says you can do that. We're saying if it's not explicitly in the state law, you can't do anything. You can't discharge any firearm in, in Amherst that's not covered under that rule that allows you to discharge a firearm under state law. This is why it gets confusing. But then we go on to say in this bylaw, well, but you can discharge a firearm for these reasons. And that's what A1 and a, the original A2 were. So, so then we said the original bylaw said, well, but you can discharge a, a shotgun or an air gun. And then you could discharge any firearm uh, for these specific reasons, self-defense, hunting, ex uh, hunting's not in there, but it, hunting's dealt with with state law. It's dealt with with state law. We determined that, um, you know, just dis humane dispatch of injured animals. You can read it all. Um, and so basically we're removing the shotgun provision from that exception. So shotguns were fully accepted and now they'd only be accepted for the same reasons, item two, anything under item two. Does that help? Okay. Are there any other um, questions? Andy? Yes. Um, I'll ask Mandy because uh, Michelle's not here and she's the presenter. I'm a little confused by the um, numbering that's left in the bylaw because there's now a one with no two. And it would seem to me that therefore we should be just saying uh, at the end of that introductory paragraph of A should not apply to uh, the discharge of fire ones, co uh, firearms colon, and then have a series of either numbered or lettered paragraphs following, but uh, having a one without a two, I was wondering if that's really good legislative construction. <laughs> Not necessarily, but we were assured that the town clerk would take care of that issue when it went to the clerk. But we can make sure next week in the motion sheet that it's taken care of. Okay, thank you. And Andy, given your legal background and Mandy Joe's, I'm going to say yes. All right, anything else on this one? And just so I recall for Kathy you have your hand up no just what Andy's eyes picked up up at the top mine picked up under B it still refers to section A2 and there won't be an A2 anymore so it just needs it's purely uh making it work okay so there's additional things in B that need to be amended to be consistent with what's under in in B that refers to A Athena? Question? No, do you, okay. you got what you need? I do, thank you. Okay. 
Um, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, then we're going to move on to the next item. Um, so last week in executive session, uh, the council met uh, we discussed the town manager's contract and compensation. Uh, based on that discussion, we uh, voted and in executive session, and we now need to reaffirm uh, the council amendment. And just very briefly, the amendment itself is to section 11.1. And it allows the town manager to use the 300, I mean, the $3,000 that we have been providing for him in the past for disability insurance to either use it for disability or life insurance. I've um, drafted an amendment to the contract. I sent it off to the town attorney. The town attorney has looked at it. Uh, the town manager has looked at it. We made one small modest change at the very end, which is item two, which says all other provisions of the existing employment agreement shall remain in full force and effect. And so our purpose, our goal tonight is to reaffirm an amendment to the town manager's contract. So the motion is as follows, to approve the amendment to employment agreement between town of Amherst, Massachusetts and Paul Bachman dated December 12, 2022 as shown on page four, of the motion sheet and to authorize the town council president to sign said document on behalf of the council. Is there a second? Second, Dublin got there. Is, are there any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a roll call vote. We begin with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Oh, I'm sorry. She is absent for this vote. Mm -hmm. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Chain. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Oh, yes. Thank you, Alicia. Shalini Baumil. Yes. Okay, so it's 12 in favor, none opposed, no abstentions, and one absent. Okay. Um, as we move on to our last really uh, meaty item tonight, uh, that we're very fortunate that Mandy Jo has been basically shepherding this area of the town manager's goals with GOL. And so this is our opportunity to speak to GOL, who will be meeting this week, about our thoughts regarding the town manager's goals. That could include either how they're organized and or substance and specifically detail. So Mandy Jo, I'm gonna just assume you're taking notes and Athena's taking notes and we're gonna move accordingly. So comments, or there's no vote on this tonight. It will come back to the council, hopefully next Monday night, the 19th. Are there any comments? Yes, Pam. Thanks. Um, on page two of the, actually in number, number four of council policy implementation, there's quite a list. And number five is housing affordability. Um, it says right now, prioritizing initiatives to increase home ownership opportunities for low and moderate income residents. And it feels appropriate to add the, the following phrase, including retention of single family homes or just homes for purchase. Because I think the retention of these homes is as critical as any other facet of, of um, availability. Um, seeing, yeah. I'm seeing question marks. Um, 
Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Pam, was there anything else? Okay. Uh, Kathy. I, I just have a question. Um, I have comments on multiple pages. Should I go through all of them or do you want to go through a page at a time? Um, and I can just give my comments when we get to that page. Mandy Joe, how would you like to proceed by individual goal? I mean, it might be more efficient to go by individual goal okay. for each of the councils. Then I'm going to suggest that Athena, you put the goals up on the, the draft up on the screen. And if we're doing the goals, those two pages, I just have one minor comment on that. So I was doing the town, I focus more on the town manager. So we have the beginning is the town council policy priorities. Are there comments on that? And I'm sorry to ask people that have now raised their hand, that if you don't have comments on the priorities, please lower your hand. Pat, you have your hand up. All right, Michelle, uh, welcome back. We'll let the record show that you're back at 810. And uh, Mandy Jo is now doing the goals since she was working on it for GOL. We just had her go ahead and work with us. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, so, uh, Kathy, you have. Yes, I, I have just one on, on the climate action. This is just purely wordsmithing. It's when it says, the 2019, um, and then it says, with a focus on enacting a wave waste hauler, that wasn't in the 2019. So I was just suggesting um, including a new 2023 uh, policy goal. So just something, because otherwise it makes it seem like we're pulling something out of a list that we've had since uh, two years before, it's purely wording it. So I wasn't questioning the waste high by law. So I'm not sure if that's clear, but when I read it, it looked like of the everything that was on the list in 2019, now we're going to focus on this one thing. And that's not, I don't think what it was meant to say. Okay. Is there any other comments on climate action? This is under town council policy priorities, climate action on that particular one. Pam oh, Rooney. Okay. Your hands up. That's what you have you your hand me. up here. Andy. Yeah. It's not on climate action. I have a um, couple of overarching um, policy goal or policy priority issues that precede the current list. So I don't know when you want to take that up. Oh, um, let's stay on this and then let's go back to that because I think several of us have this. We're talking specifically about council council policy priorities, climate action objective. Michelle? So I'll keep it to the climate action objective, but it's broader to say that um, the policy priorities, these lines at the end that indicate with a focus on or basically with a focus on, um, I'm just not sure uh, if structurally this is the right way to write the policy priorities. Um, so I'm questioning, I guess, the structure of including a focus when there are lots of different potential focuses. And like for community health and safety, why is the residential rental bylaw the focus as opposed to um many other focuses that fall under community health and safety. So I'm wondering if it almost feels like there was one blurb that has been used throughout the town council policy priorities, which is the town council will continue making progress on such and such by prioritizing appropriate legislative, regulatory, fiscal, and other actions that really is relative to all of these priorities. So like you, uh, like has happened with the town manager piece of this, we've listed out details, which is what we've heard from a lot of people. People want the, the details to be included. So I'm just wondering, 
I structurally something feels off about this to me. Okay. Andy, since we seem to have kind of eked into an area, I think you were going to comment on. Do you want to go ahead? All right, then I'll go on to Anna. So I think that mine builds on potentially what Michelle was saying, if I'm understanding it correctly, which, you know, there are several potential policy measures under climate action that I'd love to see included um, versus just one uh, one focus, uh, for example, sorry, I just switched hands. Uh, so for example, um, an energy benchmarking disclosure policy or bylaw, excuse me, residential energy performance disclosure bylaw. Um, and I can send you that phrasing. And um, additionally, uh, I'll stick with that for now. But I guess it, it leads to this bigger point of is, is right now the time where we have to come up with all the examples because I wanna make sure that we still retain some of that flexibility to do all of the things that are covered in the umbrella of the beginning sentence, if that makes sense. Um, yes, we're we're now going to open this up about the structure, and I'm I I'm going to go after Anika, but Dorothy. Dorothy, you need to unmute. You need to unmute, Dorothy. Yeah, um, I know a lot of people wanted to have the goals more specific, and. It just seems that by we're we're now saying we're going to just stick with all our goals, and it's like we're almost not saying very much, um, or unless like for example when when Michelle was commenting on the climate action, um, unless that particular thing of November eighteenth two thousand nineteenth lists very specific the very specific goals that I'm used to hearing, and the uh, waste hauler bylaw does is not mentioned in that because that's a more recent project of ours so it's really a question it's it is not in the climate action goals uh shalini i'm a little confused about um again similar idea of whether we're keeping it broad at, in the policies are we going into specifics because we uh, <clears throat> received from ecac chair a list of climate action goals and so where would that show up here i can answer i'm sorry somebody spoke over here. sorry i was gonna i can respond to to that briefly if you'd like me to or mandy probably can they're they're integrated throughout the document so um i've been tracking it on the side and they're each interwoven throughout with the ex exception of certain ones that are policy related that would be covered under that general umbrella including the one I just um, specified to Mandy. Okay, Shalini? So we're gonna edit it to include more of those, the, the policy ones here in this climate action policy. There were only three that were directly related to policy. So it was the zero waste bylaw, the energy benchmarking, and then one about uh, home rule and um, energy stretch codes. So those could be, seen as covered in this general sentence at the start. Um, and I also picked one of those because a home rule is, is a beast. And so I wanna not necessarily set that as a full goal for us right now, but um, I, not that it's not a great idea, but I, I asked to include the benchmarking disclosure bylaw in addition to the waste hauler bylaw in the policy goals. The other elements of what was um, crafted by ECAC are covered in the different areas broken out, even though it doesn't, it's not all within a climate action paragraph. They're they're broken out into infrastructure and um, policy, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay. Anika. Oh, excuse me. I meant to lower my hand. My questions and concerns have been raised already. Okay. Mandy Joe. So I think this discussion highlights the trouble a council of 13 has with policy priorities. Um, we have six, I think it is, seven, seven broad policy priorities here, but each one of us views some 
action within each of those as more important than other actions. And we have to get to at least seven of us agreeing on each one. And then, you know, in terms of whether it's in there or not, and then be able to have seven people vote in the end for it. Um, the more specific you get, the more likely it is people will peel off and not be able to vote for it because they don't believe any one thing should be part of that priority for the one year or specific thing. Um, and the more specific you get, the harder we have to do our job because we also have to think this is one year. Everything we add in here, do we think we can get done in a year? And that's one of the reasons to keep it much more general and maybe only list one or possibly two under each one. We've already seen, say, for residential rental bylaw, we've been working on it for nine months now, and we have three more months to go um, before it even comes back to the council, probably. Um, you know, and so some of these are quicker to do on a legislative basis, others are not. Um, but we have to think if these are our goals for our, our priorities for a year and our legislative priorities for one year, 12 months, what can we accomplish in those 12 months? We can't list 17 climate action things because TSO is never going to be able to get through 17 climate action things, especially if none of them have been proposed right now in legislation. Um, so I don't know what the solution is. It's in some sense why there's one or none on some of these. Um, some of them you know, are a little more expansive than others, but I think we as a council have to come up with what do we think we as a council, because that's what the policy priorities are. We as a council can get done in one year. What do we wanna focus on in that one year? Amongst these eight general priorities, what actions are most important to us. Andy. So we're getting into the general structure questions. And so I'm gonna um, say three things and try and be really quick. Uh, one is that in the um, first paragraph, I think partly picking up on part of what Andy said and partly picking up on the uh, budget guidelines, which we'll return to at our next meeting, I would have included a sentence like this. These goals cannot be achieved in a single year and will be pursued consistent with available resources. Because I think that it, um, we ought to recognize up front, exactly as Mandy said, that it's not doable in a year. And um, I think that it, um, we're doing ourselves a disservice if we don't recognize that there is resource limits to if we were really going to do all of these things, which then leads into the second uh, point that this is in the, these are all council goal for um, structural things. And I was just going to do three things. Well, so that would be the one that I would would I would I would include in the first paragraph. The second thing is that I think that we're missing an important policy priority of this council, and it is to maintain essential municipal services expected and um, uh, and supported by our residents or something of that nature. Because I think that we provide a lot of services. We spend a lot of time as a council talking about routine municipal services. It is a policy. I think it is a policy priority of the council. And we're uh, doing a disservice to um, all of the existing town departments by not just saying it up front as um, one of the town council policy priorities. And the last thing I, that I'll touch on is that I'm fine with what's put down there for the climate um, action because everything that we're doing with the exception of anything that's been added since is really tied to the community, uh, to the climate action goals. And they've been established by the council and through the CARP and the only thing that um, the council's added 
is the universal curbside pickup, um, which is um, why I would uh, just leave it alone because I think that it really does cover what we want for the climate action objective. Michelle, I'm actually, Michelle, I've already, I'm gonna go on to Pat since you've spoken yeah. once, okay? I'm adjusting some of my thinking because of what you just said, Andy, um, and it helped me understand why waste haulers, which I happen to support, but felt oddly inserted. Now I understand why uh, it's there. My concern is we do have specific overtime manager uh, performance goals. I can't hear Pat, sorry. You have to lean into the mic, Pat. Yep, there you go. I'm not even sure it's worth listening to. Um, but uh, it seems to me that I'm I'm concerned in terms of town council policy priorities. I want to be very clear that these should be what the basic policy is. And uh, Andy just led me to understand why we would add waste hauler here, because it's the newest thing that we're looking at. So I would like us to look, use that lens as we go through. I'm, my concern has to do with the priorities that we are giving to Paul. And when I look at five housing affordability in the council policy priorities, we're focusing on promoting home ownership opportunities. And this goes into what I value that, but I also value the creation of and ensure the um, operation of a permanent shelter and housing for people who are homeless. And I want that in here. We've just purchased property to do that. So that to me is new. Um, I want it here and I want it in the town manager goals because it's been those of us who have been pricking Paul uh, to remind him of the things that we most were are concerned with. Uh, and that's, you know, he said it, uh, I'm going to paraphrase this really badly, Paul, so fix it. <laughs> but in, I believe it was the housing trust meeting, you talked about how important it was for you to have specific things stated because that's what you focused on. So I want us to be very careful about how we're doing this. Uh, and I know we have more specifics when we get into council policy implementation, but you know, there's a balance here that we might need to look at as we go through each one of these. That was long-winded and maybe not valuable, which I don't often think. Pam? Thanks. I would um, support what Andy was talking about, that, that not all of these are accomplished in a single year, but I think it's really important to put them on the table um, rather than just limiting ourselves to one year look aheads, because in fact, you know, we're, we're referring to the November 18, 2019 uh, climate action goals. Well, that's a very long standing thing now. And it's clear that we're still referring to it. It's still giving us guidance from the first council. So I, I really don't want to limit to one year lookout. Um, I've struggled with this new structure and I've been very clear about that. And um, I'm still struggling with it. Um, if we're going to stay with the structure, which it appears we are, then, uh, biggest challenge we have is sitting here tonight and trying to give feedback on both our town council policy priorities and also the town manager's goals. And that's a big order. Uh, it's been a big order all along. And one of the reasons I think I've struggled with this new structure is that when we were using the old structure, it in maybe it needed to be more clear, this is policy versus this is implementation. But in, divor in divorcing the two, I think we've lost something. And that's what I'm trying, that's what I'm struggling with. Having said that, 
on this specific climate action goal. I do not believe that we have agreed to enact a waste hauler bylaw. I believe that we've agreed to explore the possible enactment. And the way this is stated, it sounds as if we have adopted that as an action. And so um, I, on that particular one, I think it needs to be, have something that basically says explore the enactment of or something like that. Uh, Anna? So my concern is that we keep saying, well, we've make, we're going to continue making progress on the climate action goals adopted in 2019. Um, and then it's, it's very, very broad. And the reality is that the climate goals adopted in 2019 are three bullet points. It's a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, 25% by 2025, carbon neutral no later than 2050, and achieve to be prepared to achieve carbon neutrality as early as 2030 by planning and advocating for state and federal action, et cetera. And then what ECAC did, and, and I watched them do it, and it was a lot of work, um, is that they pulled out the key areas of focus from the CARP and they identified specific goals and they gave us the percentage of change in emissions. My worry is that we put this goal statement out every year, but we don't give ourselves the specific action items. We've given some to Paul and I, I think that's important, but if we actually, 2030 is right around the dang corner, y'all. Like this, 2025, even closer. So some of these need to get in here specifically, some of the ones that pertain to policy, I do think are important to be in here. I am excited about a waste hauler bylaw and that cannot be the only thing that is cited in here, especially given that it's not in the specific measures that are giving us a significant change um, through the CARP. I'm not saying it's not helping, it is helping and it cannot be the only thing cited. That's that's my that's my hill I'll die on today. Everybody has one. That's mine today. <laughs> Jennifer. So I was just get, um, picking up on what Anna just said, because I, I do agree we need to um, be a little more specific or we'll find ourselves at 2030 and we'll still be saying that, mm -hmm. citing the three goals. Um, but could would that more appropriately go in the town manager goals? That's what I'm struggling with. Unless it's policy. Unless it's policy and sorting through that list and deciding which is policy and which is, um, you know, implementation, which is what the town manager and his staff do. Uh, that would need to be done. So I've done that and I'm happy to share it. Yeah, because in just, we received, um, we received an email from the Amherst Climate Justice Alliance, which I thought was really excellent. And it, you know, I don't know if that's something that can almost be tacked on to the goals or, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably items that are already, you know, appear in different places, but, and it, and it didn't ask that it all be done in a year. It talked about three years and, and beyond, but I'm just, you know, I, so can we suggest or add that these be part? It seems like it's more appropriate in the town manager goals. So one, and I'll get back to you in a moment, but one of the options, I mean, you know, we cannot just tack on a, an item. We have to discuss it. We have to agree to adopt it, or we have to agree to accept it. Um, so one of the ways out of this might be to, um, you go back to the CARP and have the town manager come to us with uh, a plan for implementing some of the higher suggested actions or something like that. And instead of us sitting here and saying, oh, we think you should do A, B, and F. So maybe under the climate action is the council will continue making progress on the climate action goals adopted by the council on November 18th by prioritizing by and in reference to the CARP, prioritize legislative, regulatory, fiscal, and other actions 
and using period and and except we don't do periods colon and then go on and do something else that's here but for us to sit here and it, it, we need a whole night just to talk about climate action okay and i'm not saying we shouldn't but we're not going to resolve that tonight okay um i'm going to go to um, Mandy Joe, only because you're kind of controlling the deck here. So it sounds like the council in general doesn't like the new structure, but struggles a little bit with the old structure in terms of the policy, which is why we had tried the right. new structure. Um, I mean, we can go back to the old structure with sort of a clarity of that council policy implementation goal in the town manager goals sort of becomes the old policy goals, but but really refers to implementation of council policy priorities or something yeah. um, or council policy or something like that. And so I, I could go back to that. I can't do that tonight, obviously, right. but um, um, but, I, you know, the carp's already in that. You know, I think a lot of the emails we got focused on the policy priorities of the council and never went to read the manager goals that had implementation of those pilot priorities right. with things like CARP and waste hauling and X, Y, and Z. And so a lot of it's already in there, as Anna said. Um, I just don't think people maybe made it that far and maybe sort of doing some sort of hybrid again, but with clearer language around the implementation of policy instead of policy goals. Mm -hmm. It might be more effective and allow us to talk more about the specifics. I, I just want to add to that thought, Mandy Jo, and then I'm going to make sure we go call on everybody. But it also, to me, by having it be a single document of policy and uh, administration, it, it, it Heart, it beckons the fact that we work within a team with the town manager. And we, we go back and forth in dialogue about how what we want to accomplish as a council translates to management and the impact it has on management. And then that comes back and further informs our policy. So I as much as I truly admire the attempt to separate them in this case, I'm not sure we've done ourselves a service. So uh, Michelle, let me just start at the top and just go down the list. So Michelle, I'm removing my hand. Okay, I have a few comments. The first is um, I have really tried to start looking at all of the documents that we're working with through our lens as counselors, and then also through how the public is viewing the documents that we're working on and um, eventually passing. So um, I would wonder, for example, with the climate action, if somebody from the public, let's say a newcomer to town, um, they came in, they pulled this up and they looked at this and they see that something was passed in November 18th. They don't see what the items I think that Anna was bulleting, um, they don't see what those items are. Um, and then they see with a focus on enacting a waste hauler bylaw, which is something that has been newly added and um, they may or may not know about. So I am just thinking in terms with my GOL hat on about how we might be able to make this structurally more clear um, to both our internal workings, as well as to if, if somebody, a member of the public were to pick this up and really want to try to understand what our priorities are. So that's the first. And then um, the second is we have a record of votes that we have taken as a council, and we have a record of votes that have been taken by previous councils. And so we, but there's no reference in this document to the record of votes. Um, so it's unclear, for example, on November 14th, in response to the July 5th incident, we have a several motions that were passed. Um, and I've uh, worked with the CSSJC to sort of look at those. They, 
many of those items don't appear at all in this document. Um, and I'm using that as an example to show that what, what may be falling through the cracks, if we don't have the record of votes um, and we don't have that clearly identified, how can we be sure and, and, and that that all of the items that we have agreed to move forward with as a council are being represented in this document. So again, with the GOL hat on, um, I would like to, between now and Wednesday when GOL meets again and we take this up again with the feedback we're receiving here, to think about some ways that we can um, take the feedback regarding structure and uh, work with Mandy on that and, and the other members, um, as well as to um, be more clear about what we have. Like I use this example of the votes on the July 5th incident there is at least, and I have a list of them, there's at least three or four, maybe five that actually don't appear anywhere in this document, but that we agreed to pursue. Um, and so I think that that's problematic and it makes me worry that there might be other, other items like that that aren't being reflected in the document. Dorothy. Well, I totally support what Michelle said, but I'm gonna say something different. Um, we have to have all of the climate action goals spelled out. Before most of the people in this council were born in the 1970s, we had Earth Day and we said we were going to do things and we promised and we didn't do them. We didn't do them. It's 50 years later. We didn't do them. And soon we were really quite concerned about what physical world we're going to be living in. Uh, we have to do that because we have to prioritize the climate action goals. This has not been my first cause in my life, but I see it has to be now because time is running out. Um, we have to do it. And I mean, just today at, at, at my book club, we realized that our very language is going to have to change. The whole concept of the iceberg, where more of it is below the surface. And I'm thinking, but soon we will have no icebergs. We, we really can't assume anything. We have to spell every one of our initiatives out on climate action because there is not going to be time to deal with it later, and there may not be enough time to do what we need to do as it is right now. Anna? Sure. So, uh, Lynn, I was a little alarmed by what you said, and I want to make sure I'm understanding it. I, I do not think that sending Paul back to the entire CARP document and saying pick from this on what to do is one, respectful of our committee time and energy and effort put into this, no. um, and, and two, the no, purpose of setting goals for the town manager. So I think that we, my, in my opinion, we should look at the list that CARP said to prioritize. That's or, sorry, that EC, it's too many acronyms, that ECAC said to prioritize, which are pulled from the CARP and go from there. I don't think that we, I don't think that's us getting into the weeds and debating individual climate measures. I think that's us looking to the expert opinion of one of our committees and saying, this is what was brought forward. And this is what we believe should be focused on. We can winnow down that list as we see appropriate, but I, I think it's abandoning our, our purview a bit to, to give so broad a goal to just say, go forth and look at the big 400 page card. I, 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 I was misunderstood. Thank you. I, don't disagree with what you're saying. Andy. Yeah, just a process suggestion. Um, last time, at the last meeting, we talked about the uh, budget policy guidelines and then uh, asked at the conclusion of the conversation, rather than picking apart and trying to edit the whole thing, um, we ended up just asking that you send Kathy a memo if you had suggestions or uh, work up on the uh, um, yeah. prior document. And uh, Kathy did, uh, did some great work on it and the uh, committee's gonna talk about it on Thursday and I get it back to you. And uh, so I think a similar process might be helpful here, not to spend the entire uh, night right. until one in the morning again, talking about each one of these action goals and then town manager goals, but just to ask that uh, all of us do something similar. I, Andy, I thank you for that suggestion. Uh, Alicia, you have your hand up. 
Um, thank you, Lynn. Um, so first, I just did want to appreciate um, all of the work that Mandy Joe did on this document, because while I do think it's helpful to see the separation of policy versus implementation, um, I do also agree that it kind of, <clears throat> I feel like it also minimizes the connection um, and how they work together. Um, and I also have more details that I'm not going to speak to that I would like to see in this document, because I want to just speak to the um, the format basically in that I also would be supportive of Mandy Joe's suggestion to go back um, and to include further specification as to certain things as such as Andy's suggestion earlier but I think that this format is a little bit tricky for me um, while again I think it's helpful to see where these things are separated and where they're they affect policy versus implementation. I think in terms of goals, policies, and in terms of ratings and um, doing our evaluation, I think our prior format was a little bit easier to work with. And then it also allows people to go into these spe specifications that we're all talking about now. And so I would prefer to see a change of format and then to go back because I don't want to offer like so so much small details to each section when I really just want the format to change. Um, so uh, again, thank you, Mandy Joe, but I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks, Alicia. Kathy. I am totally supporting the, what I think is an emerging idea that, that we're only we only got to the first page of the first two pages. We never got to the town manager performance goals. And we actually have to have that other document. And what Alicia just said is we have to have a document that if we think of 12 months from now, we're going to go through and say, did this happen? Did this not happen? What do I know about it? Um, and so I focus most of my um, attention on starting on page one, I think we should just, it, it was an attempt at a new structure, but I think we should start with, if we send comments in, I think we should send comments in on the town manager section is where I was gonna go, Andy, instead of trying to rewrite the first two pieces, because adding a lot of detail there won't help with the, the manager's goals. And when I went through what we have now in the town manager structure, we have eight, Roman numeral sections, but one of them has six subsections called policy implementation. So there are actually 13 sections that we would be rating. And so we have one town manager and some incredibly wonderful staff and in various departments, then we have schools. So we do also have to come up with something we think is, this is what we think could happen in the next year and this is part of a multi-year strategy. So we might want a long-term plan around something to see it, but we don't expect to achieve it. So my edits were on pieces that, yes, year one. And then some things I don't think the town manager has to focus on in the coming year. And I'll use one example, but I'll send my comments in. We're funding the reparations fund. And until we have a how we might spend it, uh, there's not a lot at the town manager level because we've got a funding mechanism. So it's listed explicitly as a performance goal. And I would move something else in because I think there are other things that we have asked the staff to work on. So going through, think with a lens on what would the staff be doing on it, getting grants, you know. So I'd like to recommend that people focus on ignore the first two pages while thinking of our policies and then going through this. And do we need to break this policy implementation section up into big bullets so that we didn't bury it? But I didn't find it difficult to think of what was missing there, but that's where most of my comments were. So it's, it's the structural shift, Alicia, as you were saying that, like, where am I gonna comment on things I wanna comment 12 months from now? So just try to think of the way we just went through and what is at too small a level or at, it's a multi-year level um, when we make our comments. Um, 
that's my overarching. And Mandy, I understand what you were trying to do, but I think we keep getting stuck on page one of our goals and we never get to the town right. manager right. performance yeah. goals. So I want, would like to jail to start on, to flip it and focus on the other section because we, Paul needs to know what we want him to focus on starting in January and we're halfway through December, so. Right. Shalini? Um, so the waste hollow bylaw has been brought up a couple of times, whether it belongs there. And I just wanted to say that I, I believe it belongs in the policy just because the town council voted uh, we to send it to TSO and finance committee to work on it. So I think it's something we have already voted that the council wants um, us to look at and in collaboration with the staff. Um, and the council policy implementation part does have the um, the waste bylaw implementation pieces. So it is there in the town manager goals. However, again, it seems to be lost. And I think this new version, it's everything is under council policy implementation. So I think for the public and generally we, it, we're not uh, highlighting our focus, like climate action, community health. All of these are like subsections under policy versus, um, you know, it being very clear for the town manager goals that climate action, community health and safety, economic vitality. I think all of those deserve to be their own major sections. I think that's lost in the current format, which is kind of what Kathy was saying, I think. Yeah. I think that's what several of us are now saying. Uh, Pam? Uh, I can come back to you. Go to Jennifer, okay? Yeah, just quickly, I, I was also picking up on what Shalini was saying and, and the concern Lynn expressed that since we haven't adopted the bylaw amendment for the waste hauler, but since in order to get to the point that we would come back to the full council with um, the amendment or the bylaw in a form that the council could vote on does is going to take a certain amount of staff time. Mm -hmm. And that's why the town manager asked that we included that in his goals, because they really have to make time to work through it to get to the point that we can come back to the council. And I did want to, you know, just express support um, for what Andy said that just delivering basic services should, should probably be a goal that we recognize because it's not um, an easy lift just to keep the trains running on time and snow through the clouds. Um, Pam Rooney. Thank you. Um, the Going back to the conversation about our policies versus, versus town manager goals, <clears throat> if I, I struggled with it because I could look at every single one of them and just say, well, it really boils down to doing the legislative regulatory actions needed. So we could almost use that as a as a preface <laughs> to the whole document that the town council's responsibilities are to support, you know, our our targets, the town manager's goals through um, legislation, regulatory actions, um, and that and that in a way feedback from town manager and staff to town council saying, if you want me to accomplish this, then you need to pro provide the following pieces of legislation or something like that. So our, our policy role is, is just really could be summarized with, with that little string of items, if that makes sense. So Mandy Jo and Michelle, and I'm in this case, I'm looking to the person who's been more of the architect of this document. Would you like us to give you feedback using this document? Or would you like us to give you edit into the old town manager goals? I would love feedback on the 
performance goals that start with administration and leadership and move down to implementation because if I get that feedback I can move it into sort of that hybridish structure that we've had in the past that we've had in the past okay. with some word changes all right so here's the plan but Lynn okay. could I also respond to that please yes I just I I would like to try to find a time um, for Mandy and I to meet tomorrow um, to talk about this together if if we can possibly do that um, so that when we get to GOL on Wednesday um, we have a little bit we have a plan that we've at least two of us have discussed I I totally assume that and accept that um, Either, are there any other comments? I see more hands, but I'm trying to move this to how are we going to proceed? Shalini? I have um, um, a, a clarifying question for Paul, actually. So can I ask that now? Please. Okay, so in the council policy implementation for the first one climate action, so, you know, the number A item where it says that uh, the goal is to, uh, and the goal that's supporting appropriate committees and staff regarding adoption and implementation of waste hauler bylaw and subsequently seeking avoiding this in accordance if said waste hauler bylaw is adopted. So it feels like we're going circular because we need the town staff to go and look at, you know, do the whole, which we are already doing the RFQ and all of that. So it will require you to actually dedicate some staff already to, in order for us to find out how we will be able to implement the bylaw. So I just want to make, be, I wanted clarification that you're not wait, asking us to adopt the bylaw and then you will, um, uh, appoint you appoint staff to study and or is it just for the implementation is my question clear it, I, oh. I i'm not sure I, i'm not clear on your okay okay so it says that you will appoint staff like you will you know appoint your staff and so forth if the waste hauler bylaw is adopted but we can only adopt the waste by hauler bylaw if you appoint staff, which we're doing right now to work with Susan Wade mm -hmm. in order to gather information and give it back to the TSO committee, and then we will work. So it's kind of like, it's a reiterative process. Like what I'm saying is we can't wait for you to appoint staff only after we adopt it because we can't adopt it till the staff does some initial work. So what's important to me is to hear from the council what your priorities are um, you have a number of things that you have brought into the council and then have referred to committee, not just waste haulers, but we have a street lights policy that's in the same position. And I think what I'd like to see is what are your priorities as a council, because then when I build the budget, I will assign budgetary support for the things that you want to accomplish. So um, just simply referring, having an item come here and refer to a council committee doesn't mean that it suddenly is a priority of the council the way I read it until the council has said, and through your goal setting process, that this is a priority for us. Um, we support counselors in their development of their ideas and their proposals, which what we're doing for both of those proposals as we speak. Um, and we'll, like with the grant that we got to support with Susan Waite to support the exploration of the RFQ for uh, waste hauling. Um, so in terms of dedicating staff time we're happy to do that piece of it when it gets into more development of the proposal because doing waste hauling takes a long time it's, i mean to look at that to develop a policy that's going to work well uh an implementation plan all that thing takes all that takes time you know but if that it would be helpful for me is to have the council say yes this is what we really want you to dedicate time to um or explore i think that's what we're talking about is are we exploring we're in an exploratory level here um i'm not sure if i made myself clear on the answer but i think that that's what i'm asking for one more Shelley. um so actually what you just said also to some degree answers what michelle you had raised that we have voted on several things and should they all automatically show up on the town council priorities and what i'm hearing you say is that just because we passed 
like even the way Paul or bylaw we pa passed it to the committee wouldn't necessarily become a town manager goal unless we listed it as a priority in this document. I'm going to be judged on what you put into this document, right? My performance next year, a year from now is going to be judged on what you put into this. So what you should put into this document is something that you want to have accomplished during the course of the year. It shouldn't be everything that you say. It should be everything that you want to prioritize and say, here's what we're, how we're going to judge the town manager. Um, so we want to see tangible progress. And now saying that it could be an, it, it could be a list of 45 different things, which has happened in the past. Um, so I think the idea is to prioritize the things that you feel are most important. It doesn't mean it's all inclusive. It, it, so you don't have to say everything that's going to be in it. You just have to say, these are the top things that we care the most about, because I need to be able to say off the top of my head to my staff, these are the highest priorities for the town and, and then have the, our staff be able to internalize that. We've done that with uh, racial equity and with climate, climate action. Um, every staff member can tell you those are the two highest priorities for our community right now. And um, so I think as we continue to narrow down the number of things and really concentrate our message um, of what your highest priorities are, that's, what, that's how this document is powerful. So um, Michelle and Mindy Joe. Uh, we're going to send this document in a word version tonight to counselors. They will get feedback to you by when. So I would love to have the feedback now, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, at least in general, right? Like if we go to, I mean, it's technically page three of the full document, but it's paid. I, I put numbers because I imagined them split into two documents. So I renumbered it starting at one, but the town manager goals starting with administration and leadership. I'd love to know if people have problems with anything in that and whether they'd want to see changes and then move on to the next one. And the next one, people can send me specific wording, hopefully by late tonight, but noon tomorrow at the latest because GOL meets 9 a.m. Wednesday. And it's going to take me a while to redo the whole structure and incorporate what will likely be conflicting requests. So you would like us to spend the time now going through starting on page three? Yes. All right, let's put the everything up that's starting on page three. And under the very first one, I'm not even going to deal with the opening paragraph. That can be done with wordsmithing. Under administration and leadership. Comments. Dorothy. I have to tell you, I am not prepared to do this tonight. It's I'm nine o'clock and I'm tired and I have a class tomorrow. Then Dorothy, I'm going to ask that you try to get any other comments that you can. Um, but um, at this point, just I'm asking people to read that paragraph and see if there's anything in there that jumps out at you as problematic. I'm not seeing a hand, so I'm gonna go on to personnel management. Mandy Joe. Andy, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, um, I guess I would, uh eliminate to begin with the Amherst Police Department in the last line. Um, Mandy Joe. And I was gonna request a deletion of that whole phrase in sub item five that starts focusing first on the guidance. So it's that would start that that starts with focusing first on the guidance in the town councilors vote. So 
so just more of what Andy said, but the, the rest of the phrase I was so going to request just elimination have, of. You just say fostering an anti-racist culture throughout all town departments. Yes. Period. Michelle? Yeah, this is a sticky point. And um, I think I'm looking right now at what we passed on November 14th, which is to recommend the town manager to work with the APD to review and I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, just give me a second here. Um, okay, to recommend the town manager assist the APD in building upon current efforts and identifying steps to develop a proactive anti-racist culture in the Amherst Police Department and that it be documented and regular updates be provided to the council. So we passed that motion essentially within the framework of a four month turnaround in which Paul would report back to us um, on his progress on this. So I am not understanding why there is an issue with keeping the APD in there, if that's a motion that we passed um, as a council. And I just, I'm trying to understand the perspective better from Andy and Mandy on why there's concern about doing that. If it's back to the same argument that we argued on the day of the vote about whether or not APD should be identified, I think we already had that argument. And we voted and the vote passed. Can, can I just, before we get into a debate about this, say, remember, this is over a full year. It's right. not just the next four months. And so when we say fostering an anti-racist culture throughout all town departments, that's over the full year. Right, but this says focusing first. We want the town manager to be clear that we want the APD to come first. And that's what we voted as a council. Okay. Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. I so basically I'm just supporting um uh, Michelle's previous argument, but just wanted to add in that the motion itself didn't specify the four month time period um, and also just anti-racism in nature is ongoing like you can't just do four months and then become anti-racist the act of being anti-racist is the continually working on it and so I would see that this would be happening continually throughout the the year I also don't understand why if it's something that we passed <clears throat> as a motion um, why it wouldn't be put in the town manager's um, goals because it's something that we have already agreed upon and have already asked the town manager to do. So to put it in there to see that that is something that is being followed followed through upon and to see that that is being prioritized, I think is important um, in the follow through of something that has passed. I think it makes sense to, to want to add that this will also happen throughout all town departments. I think that that is true as well. And so I think that both should be included. Okay. Kathy? Kathy. I, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just trying to um, both listen and respond. I think by saying by calling out just police and saying, do this first. We have a DEI director and I'd like her to be looking across all departments. And it it is the discussion we had um, when we were talking about this, Michelle, because I, it's not clear to me that we have a, a specific problem in a specific area, but I think we should be doing this across the board and We've given her those, her in the department, those marching orders. So I would agree on removing this phrase, um, but it is in uh, the work plan already. Uh, so um, I don't know how I would evaluate whether one specific thing had been done in a series of months. So I've always wondered how we are gonna know this because we've talked about doing uh, training sessions 
in multiple staff areas. So I agree with the proposed deletion of that sentence. We're going to, um, I'm going to take four more comments on this and then I'm going to move on to finance. Pat? Can hear you, Pat. Sorry. Um, I would like to maintain the uh, fostering um, a proactive anti-racist culture throughout all town departments. Um, I feel like one of the things that I've seen in town hall at different times is uh, rather um, insulting behavior in regards to some of our uh, BIPOC residents by town staff uh, in um, receptionist areas and different things. So it's not something that's, yes, there was this July 5th incident and there was a real examination of a lot of things. I'm not gonna get into that that examination was limited. Um, and I, I feel strongly uh, and agree that working to make myself to be a proactive anti-racist human being takes ongoing work. And so I feel strongly that I don't want to single out the police department. And there are individuals in the police department who need this ongoing work, just like I need it. Um, and just like receptionists at the desk downstairs need it. And um, people, you know, people who are interacting with our committees need it. Um, so I, I'm very comfortable leaving that out. Uh, Anika. Uh, yeah, so I think that, you know, um, this one is, is uh, packed, but there are a couple of things. Um, I believe when it comes to fostering an anti-racist culture, it's far time that we really broaden our vision um, as opposed to singling out um, departments. Um, in regards to the police department, uh, they have been used as an example in part, not just with the July 5th incident, but just linking to um, establishment of the police in general, um, but in part because of the July 5th incident and before, they probably of all the departments have probably gone through the majority of training, the, the most training, they're, they're under the highest um, scrutiny. And if we look at our town and we want to be realistic and we want to talk about, you know, historical truths and facts, um, we're, we're sitting in a building that has the same historical truths and reputations. But I think we can all agree that we have um, a diverse staff here, just as our police department is more diverse than this town council um, and many other uh, departments. So. Um, where I agree that this work is important all around, I think that we are really backing ourselves in corner when we are just saying, you know, um, police department, where if we actually, I believe, if we look at departments and see where our complaints have come from, both historically and recently, if we're talking about BIPOC community, would the police be number one? I don't think so. Um, and that is me, you know, speaking for um, just myself, but I think that it is important as we're talking about um, broad views and giving direction. I mean, this is a lens that I think should be in every department and every um, committee um, and goings on throughout our, our community. Okay. And I think we're I losing that opportunity by focusing on the department that is probably having the most um, training and mm -hmm. scrutiny at this point. Okay, we are not going to settle this tonight. GOL has heard your feedback. Shalini, I'm sorry, but I need to keep moving through this. GOL has heard your feedback. When they come back, people can vote to amend and either keep it in or not. Lynn, can I make a point of order, please? Yes. Um, if we, if a counselor would like to continue this discussion, um, how do we, what is the method that we have in order to continue this discussion now? Can I make a motion that 
we continue? Nope, I'll just honor the fact that you want to continue to have the discussion. Okay, We're not, we you. are not going to resolve this sitting here tonight. Shalini? Even if we don't resolve it, I just feel fair that we all get to at least say, at least say what we want to say about it and, and at least that much. So thank you, Michelle. Um, I think what I wanted to say is we could potentially be making a big mistake by uh, focusing on the Amherst police. And I just want to read this statement to you, for, for example, like by sing, singling out a single department and how that can come across to the people, their families, their kids, when we single out a specific department. For example, if we were to say this as fostering an anti-racist culture throughout all town departments, focusing first on the town clerk, you know, how would we feel about that? Or how would Athena feel about that? Like if he singled out, you know, focusing on one. So I don't think shaming or bring, you know, I, it, to me, that's problematic as part of our values of grace, where we've all agreed we want to make space for people to learn and grow. And so that's number one, that shaming aspect. Secondly, uh, I think it's a mistake because we don't really know which departments need most urgently need this training. And I say that because just recently, uh, I heard an example with Anna actually, and I'm not gonna name the department again, but it was from a BIPOC member of a community saying how they feel they're not heard. And I will communicate that with Paul separately, but it is not the police department. And over and over again, I've heard different, uh, never about the police, and which is not to say the police doesn't deserve to go through that training. But I really feel that the DEI director needs to be given that, if that is indeed our intent, to create a culture of anti-racism, um, we need to be very seriously and forcefully asking, not forcefully, but, um, but really, uh, unanimously asking the DEI director to assess the departments that really uh, need this and to roll out a plan of systematically uh, offering these anti-racism trainings. So those are my two things. Thank you. Um, Alicia? Uh, yes, thank you, Lynn. Um, so I don't see this motion as singling out a department. That's not the intention of this at all. Um, and again, I think it's the same thing when we're looking for progression and to improve things in the community and in the environment, asking for change isn't necessarily saying something bad about somebody or something. And so I think I struggle with this conversation every time we have it because for some reason, the implication is that I'm saying something bad about the police department. However, nowhere in this statement does it say anything about the actions of the police department or that I feel negatively about them in any type of way. And so what I'm looking for is for us to step away from the idea that this is calling them out on anything because nowhere is this calling them any type of name or, in, or claiming that they are something different. But simply stating that at this current time, there are no policies put in place in any of our departments across the town that focus on anti-racism. Anti-racism is when we have policies that look at specifically fighting against racism, not just simply not being racist, not just being kind people. It, it's very different. It has a very different intention and a very diff different implication. And so again, I see this as an improvement, as as something that we would celebrate that we are doing, not something that we're calling out somebody or that we're saying something bad about their name or their profession. We know that as a town that we appreciate our police officers. We know that as a town, we appreciate all of our town staff. And we know that as town and as people in general, that every single person can always be better. And so I think when we're looking at what improvements can be made, we can say we know that throughout all of town, all of the departments need to get anti-racism training and that this should be ongoing, not even just one year, but all years, all of the time, because again, it is active work that you need to 
consciously work on every single day. It's not just something you can have one or two trainings on every year and you're all set. But that why would we not focus on the department that we already passed a motion to focus on? And so we don't need to wait for these things to happen is the same argument that I made when this motion was on the floor. And so we're not arguing the fact of whether or not we want this to happen because it's already going to happen because we have already passed it as a motion. So right now we're arguing the fact as to whether or not to include it in the town manager goals and what we'll be evaluating him on for next year. And it doesn't make sense to me to say that we are passing this and we want this to happen, but we're not going to look at the progress of this in terms of making sure that things are following through on what we voted. So to me, it just doesn't make sense that we're still making the argument for something that we have already made the argument for that has already passed. And we're trying to argue against it again, but we're not arguing. I, I think the argument is the placing it of in placing it in the goals, which doesn't make any sense to me since it has already passed as a council initiative. We have already instructed the town manager to do so. So I think that's where my confusion lies in this entire conversation. Um, and again, I think I stated this in the GOL meeting. I'm not sure if I stated it in the council meeting, but my thought about how the process of this works is that we are adding things that we have already agreed to as a council as goals and things that we are moving forward, perhaps motions that have passed or specific actions that we have voted upon so that we can effectively track and measure the way that we are moving forward on the things that we have already voted on. Michelle? Um, first, I wanna say that I do trust that both Pamela and Jennifer um, will roll out anti-racist uh, training throughout the departments and will honor the motion that has been passed. I really do believe that. However, I think that we really need to think about applying the same rules across the board. And if we, we passed a motion, I would just invite you to consider another motion that maybe doesn't have this emotional charge for you um, that was passed. And we were asking for that to be simply included into the town manager goals. I don't think it would be a problem. Um, and I think that the more sort of, and, and we've done it actually throughout this document, we have referenced um, throughout this document, other votes um, and so if we are going to remove this vote, we need to remove all of the votes that we're referencing. Um, and then I also just want to say a more nuanced comment. I believe that this discussion in part is in response to earlier discussions we had and is in part response to recent meetings that have been held at the Amherst Police Department with members of the town council. And I feel like for the benefit of Alicia and Pam Rooney, who did not attend those meetings, um, it's important and I personally feel in conflict as a counselor knowing, and I shared this with Lynn, um, I feel personally in conflict knowing that those meetings happened in which us, members of the council were listening to feedback from the APD. And we have counselors such as Alicia, um, who has spent an enormous amount of time working on issues related to policing that was not in the room for those discussions. And that was her choice and I'm not, but what I'm saying is that's problematic because what we're talking about here is actually something I think much bigger and I feel that we need to come back to this discussion as a council. I feel like we need to unpack what we learned when we were sitting in the community room at the police department. And we need to talk as a council about what we learned from our um, from the July 5th incident. And we need to um, be able to express ourselves around that 
that situation that occurred there. I felt that that was, um, while I understood the intentions of it, um, a bit of a bit of being in dangerous territory, honestly. And um, and I and I had a lot of concerns coming out of it. And while I really appreciated hearing from uh, members of the police department, um, I don't. I think that we need to create a container to do these things and to have these discussions. And I think that this is just a manifestation of that not being fully um, uh, embodied right now in terms of the council. Thank you. Pat. Thank you. Um, one of the worst experiences I've had in this town had to do with something that happened at the senior center um, from members of the senior center uh, staff and um, teachers who were hired uh, in the senior center. Um, and it impacted a person I care a great deal about who is a black person. And I feel very strongly that we're missing something really important when we single out only the police because we need to do this work in all departments. And singling out the police and saying that it isn't a, and I appreciate this Alicia and I, I believe you because I know you, but the police department, police departments have an incredibly negative reputation that is in many, many places is more than well-deserved. So if we're honoring that there has been work done in the police department, there will be continuing work done on the police department, then let's honestly and openly begin to look at the other departments that we think are so wonderful when I know they're not. Even as a white person, I know they're not. And, and stop saying, oh, we're, stop saying that it's gotta be the police first. I agree with Michelle that we need a container or a place to really begin to sort out both our interactions in the last few, few weeks meeting with the police department and sort out re reactions and implications of the July 5th meeting that many of us felt incredibly uncomfortable in stating. So it's not an easy thing. But I refuse to, at this moment, include one department. But if we're going to do that, then make it the senior center. Thank you. Kathy, you still have your hand up? Anika, you have your hand up? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I can, I can speak for myself. Um, I would say the same thing regardless of whether I had spoke to the police department or not in terms of that this lens should be for all departments. Um, I'm not looking at this and responding thinking that the police, um, you know, we cannot call out the police or any other department. I do believe the police are different. They um, carry guns and have a rep reputation as, as police in general. And they can, you know, they they have law over human beings that other departments do not. With that said, I still believe that this department has is probably at the top of the um, the trainings that are going on. And there may be, you know, some that are speaking and saying what they're saying because they um, have talked to the police. Um, but I I think as counselors, it is our responsibility we were voted in um, by the the broad community here that does include um, the police department and we should really be able to listen to um, anyone regardless of our stance or position I would I would like to give us each more uh, credit that I don't think that we're um, arguing down a point and because we have done our duty as counselors and speak with our um, constituents and, and residents. I think that if anything, um, what about departments as as um, 
have just been pointed out that aren't having this lens brought to them. You know, it's, it should just be across the board or we're, you know, getting into the weeds of, again, the probably the most over-police over police department in terms of what their training is. Alicia? Um, thank you, Lynn. I just wanted to make a statement in response to what Michelle said and just to make it clear that um, I did not attend the conversation with the police department because I didn't notice that there were two times offered. And the first time that I saw on the email was conflicting with my schedule, as was the other one, but I just didn't see it anyhow. So my schedule just didn't allow me to be there. Otherwise, I would have, have loved to be there. Um, and so I, it, I am regretful that I did miss the opportunity to speak with the APD. Um, and I would be open to hearing their feedback and how they feel and all of those things. However, that doesn't change my stance on believing that both of these sentences should be included and that both of them are impactful. Um, and I won't spend too much time arguing this, just in that all town departments, yes, should focus on fostering an anti-racist, a proactively anti-racist culture all of the time. Starting with the APD has significance, again, not because we're singling them out, not because we're saying they're bad people, not because we're saying their department is worse than any other department, but because the police department, the police as a department has such a different profound impact on the life and possible trajectory of someone's life than the clerk in the town hall. It just really does because they are going out into the community to people's houses, to people's homes, into people's communities in the most intimate ways that other departments are not. And so that is why it makes sense. Not again, not because I'm calling them out, not because they're bad people at all. That has nothing to do with my decision or my thinking behind this or the implications in my mind of this sentence itself but the, it will have the most profound impact or it has the possibility to have the most profound impact because of the way the department is set up, just because of the nature of the job itself and because of the way that they're in, interacting with the community. You don't have to go seek the police station. You don't, the, the police, you don't have to go into the police station to encounter a police officer. They are out in the community interacting with people in their homes, in their neighborhoods in the streets, in their cars, driving on the highway, all around. It is a completely different statement, a completely different process to be happening than when we're focusing on someone who is inside of a building that you have to actively go to, to be in an interaction with them. Michelle? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, and I, I'm not, I, my intention was not to speak for any one counselor when I talked about the listening sessions. Um, my intention was to say that Alicia and I believe Pam didn't have the benefit of hearing from the police department yet um with respect to what their experience has been um both professionally and personally um as a result of the July 5th incident and so what we're talking around here a little bit is my interpretation is that members of the police department feel that professionally and personally they have been targeted and attacked and we can debate all day whether that should be the case or not but that's how they feel. And counselors also in my presence expressed regret about ways in which we handled the incident um, of July 5th. And so what I'm simply saying is that we, as a council, I believe, and maybe I just need to ask Lynn, um, to find an opportunity, whether it's in a retreat, uh, a mini retreat, or whether it's in a town council, to unpack some of those feelings that were expressed to us by members of the police department, as well as some of the feelings that counselors walked away with. Um, because when I'm listening to Alicia right now, and knowing that she was not there in that room. It, there's a disconnect in the sense that that information, that what we as counselors learned in those meetings um, is 
could potentially impact the way that we want to address this. I'm not saying that we should remove, I don't, I, I haven't come to a conclusion about whether or not we should remove um, beginning with the Amherst Police Department, but I can understand that there may be a council discussion around a shift in the way in which we may want to approach this matter going forward. And I believe we need a container and potentially a facilitator, because while I agree with Anika that any one of us should listen to our departments um, and to our constituents, and excuse me, Anika, if I if, if I botched your words, but I my, my concern is that those listening sessions sort of came up in a very, um, I would say, organic way. Um, they were not facilitated um, and they, I think, left us, us out there hanging a bit in the sense that um, had Alicia maybe been in the room and learned and listened to some of the things, and again, I will not speak for Alicia, even my own self, I will say some of the things that I heard were concerning to me. And so that doesn't mean I don't want to listen and I don't want to hear those things, um, but I feel like we need to have some sort of facilitated container to continue to have those discussions and do so in a way that really um, gives us all, including the police department, the most integrity and respect um, uh, that we all deserve. Pat. Thank you. Um, I wanna say a personal thank you to Alicia for your last statement about the difference between the police department in terms of going into people's homes and the intimacy of that. Um, that does make a difference to me in terms of how I'm looking at this. But if we're going to, con to have that line about the police department, I would like to have your partial, you know, I think it could be boiled down to a pithy, clear sentence about the intimacy, about the difference, and that's why we're focusing on the police department. Because otherwise, I feel like whatever your intentions are, it continues to hit at men and women who feel attacked. And and, and that doesn't feel okay to me. It really doesn't feel okay to me. And it's, there's so many things to say that, you know. So I could stay with that sentence. If we clarify the reason that we're saying that they're first, I can do that. And I really, really thank you for bringing my attention there. We're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to come back and take up finance. Sure. Which is that we not start. I hear Mandy Jo wanting this by noon tomorrow, but I don't, I don't think that this is the best way to do this. So I really think that we should do right wing. I'm really glad we had the conversation that we just had, although. But I feel like this is not the best way to use that I do think if we're going to do that, we then we need to recognize that we will probably not finalize the town manager's goals until January 9th. I I, I just want to be fair both to the council and particularly to GOL and just recognize that that I would like to go back to that other thought that we give people feedback. And even then, when we come back with the goals, there's going to be further discussion, which is what we just like we just had. Does this belong here? Doesn't it belong here? Mandy Jo? So at some point we're gonna have to do what we just did because 
-hmm. there's already conflicts in what people want in and what people want out. And unless we have those conversations in the full council, right? I, I can't, GOL can't even make a choice, right? I, and I so we totally can't agree. avoid this conversation, which is why I was hoping to get through at least with people's initial thoughts on what's here. What do you, what's missing? What's not, what, what would you take out of what's here? What would you add in? Because GOL can't actually do its job until it's heard that too, I don't think. I'm going you know, to hear from Dorothy and then from Andy, and then we'll make a decision which way we're going to go. Dorothy? I am using a word I rarely use, uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. This discussion about private conversations with the town council and the police department. I also was unable to go. Seven o'clock was not fine, and it con at the other time conflicted with a class. When the police department, you know, yes, I support the police department, and I, and I understand there are people with feelings, but you know, there are people in our community who are very upset, who also have feelings, and they were not part of this conversation. And I think for the police department to only talk about what they feel and think and whatever it is, just to the town council, completely shutting out. I, I just feel that we're doing, you know, if, if if I were one of the community people that was upset about July 5th, I would be having an absolute fit saying, what are they doing? How do they have this special time to sit and talk down about their feelings? Nobody cared about ours. Nobody talked to us. The police department did not talk to okay. them. I, I'm, I'm. Okay. I, please I, I, finish or we're taking a break. I'm calling a break right now. We will reconvene at 945.
Lynn, I don't know if this is intended, but I see your mouth's moving and I can't hear you. So it, I know we had issues earlier today with that. So I just no, want it's it's not. Um, I was making a comment to Andy who had suggested that we set a time limit on the meeting. Oh, no worries. I just wanted to make sure we weren't having the same earlier issue. No, as far as I know, we're not. Um, please turn your video back on when you return. I don't see how Pat could have turned her video back on, but that's okay. All right, uh, Andy. I was just going to request to the council that we set a time limit tonight, regardless of meeting, getting through the entire list. I don't think that we're doing ourselves or our staff a favor by meeting again until a very late hour. Okay. Um, I'd like to just set a time limit on each item. Um, and I'd like that time minute limit to be five minutes. And if we have to debate an issue, then we may have to come back to it. Um, Mandy Jo, give your hand up. Anika. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just, um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, set something straight. We have enough division. Um, in this community to be, you know, having members of the council spreading mistruths. The police department did not reach out to council specifically to want to talk to us and only us. Um, and one of the things that we learned is how they have an open door policy and they can speak with anyone. And where I understand um, the those that were involved in the July 5th, they have feelings and there may be some that would you know might say many things about us as a town council speaking uh with the police department however the police are residents they are constituents they voted us in or not just like others and again regardless of our stance or position if we cannot be bothered to listen to people and are we actually saying i mean we sat through many meetings and though we did not as a council and for many reasons, um, because youth and other reasons, so we did not speak directly with those um, involved um, within the July 5th incident, we were certainly made, our, made it known that we would and that we would be open. However, we did not extend that to the police department. And I think we have a bigger issue if we cannot speak to um, members of this community and the departments um, the, in you know, humanize the police. They're not all uh, one person. And um, I, again, I think that unless, as um, Alicia had pointed out, and Pam, if you had a reason, a schedule conflict, or for whatever reason, you were not able to attend, that's one thing. Um, but to not speak to members of our community because you're concerned of what a community member may think of you, um, I, I just, I don't know where, where are we? Why are we here? Um, again, this is not about your position or stance, but what are we actually doing? If we will just isolate people like that, we won't even listen. Mandy Jo. Uh, Anika said it better than I ever could. Thank you, Anika. Going on to finance, could you please scroll it down so that we can go all the way? look at the whole thing at once. This is the finance objective. It starts up to ensure the town's strong financial and fiscal health by. Pam Rooney. 
Uh, last sentence of that um, number seven, ensuring all user fees, et cetera, consider and cover the cost of providing services efficiently because you could create all kinds of services that aren't needed and then you have to pay for them. So I would just try to focus it on being efficient. Okay. Any other comments on finance? Just okay. Pam, do you mean efficient provision of services? Okay, just because you, you can't All ensure you're efficient. Fine. So I'm just, what you're saying is you want the efficient to, okay. Okay, we're going on to go to council policy. Pol oh, I'm sorry, Michelle, did you have something on finance? No, okay. on council policy implementation. Okay, uh, so we we'll deal with climate action. Uh, Michelle? Okay, so you're going to go one by one on these? I think we have to. Okay, then I'm going to put my hand down. Okay, Pam, Rooney, you have your hand up or not? Kathy? I have typed up comments, so I can also send them in, but um, just to go through, I have no problem with Ritz here. I would just tighten it up. I'm not sure on the first one where we say this has to be all done in one year. So on waste hauler bylaw and us and and plans to implement, I would change it because it's a lot, a lot to go from how are we going to do it to actually award and implement it in, in terms of if we're talking about it, a one year goal. Um, so I would just edit that down. Then on the second one, wait. I I just really want to stay with climate action. Okay. I am on I am on climate action. Oh, B. second one B. I'm on B. I'm sorry. I, I'm Thank I'm you. extremely focused. One B. I'm I'll, I'll try to be quick. So the second one, we're my understanding based on this past year, we are at the point where we could actually implement. So instead of make substantial progress, I unless someone tells me, can't we implement Community Choice Act? Could we make that? Is that a, do, a feasible uh, 12, within the next 12 months? It looks to me like we have most of the pieces. Then in C, um, Anna will jump in here, but I would just like to come up with a specific list instead of saying per, per party, da, 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 and and we could say such as, and we come up with a discrete list. I don't think we can put everything, but but a few things that we think are doable there. And I was tempted at first to make it a footnote on this, including the following. But I I think we, do we mean every single thing that was prioritized, or do we want to pick out some? And I'm not in a position to pick out them. Okay, Mandy Joe. Um, just on the first one, the supporting appropriate committees and staff, I would just modify that to supporting TSO regarding adoption and staff regarding implementation of a waste hauler bylaw because we've referred it to TSO. So that's really the committee that needs support for adopting the bylaw. It also, it's... Well, it comes oh. back to us after it's written really well right, right. It comes back so, to um, it's really tso like it's really crc that needs the support for rental registration not necessarily the whole yeah. council right i i i personally think that the specificity is not needed and you never know when you might have to bring in another committee for something but i hear what you're saying um mandy uh, could could we then maybe just say supporting work towards adopting an implementation, implementing a waste halt, something like that to get rid of committee reference at all, something like that. I can sure. reword it, but. Yeah. Anna? So I, I think that, Kathy, I hear what you're saying on the third point. Um, I'm curious if it would make sense to, uh, God, I like don't want to say it, um, adopt what ECAC had written in terms of these are what they had prioritized for the next year um, instead of you know, I, I guess 
unless there's a clearer list for what's been prioritized for fiscal year 23 and 24. But as of right now, I'm not super clear on whether we met 22. So I think that there's there's a little bit maybe to, to reassess there. And one of the things that ECAC talked about um, prioritizing, one of their 10 was creating a database to track that transition, um, which would, you know, make our jobs easier looking forward. But I, I, I guess I'm not convinced that the things that were prioritized for fiscal year 23 and 24 are necessarily the same. That's a cross check I'd have to do. Um, and I might ask the council to consider taking the document of, of 10 items. Maybe I need to do the cross check first and come back to you. But um, otherwise, I, I think we could take the list of 10 items that ECAC said were the priorities uh, and, and adopt those as the fiscal year or as the next year, excuse me, and, um, goal items. So, Anna, I, I have a great deal of respect for ECAC, but I really would want the town manager to weigh in on the feasibility of those 10 and which are the sure. top priorities before we write it into goals. Okay, uh, I think yeah, top priority, um, I, excuse me, feasibility, yes. I, I have concerns about, you know, whether going off of this list to find things that would be an additional priority, because yeah. it's good, especially because, you know, there are staff included on in this process as part of ECAC. So I think um, feasibility would be a discussion I'd be very interested in. And I think that that applies to all of these goals, not just the climate action Absolutely. goals. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, any other comments on climate action? Mandy Jo, you have your hand up? No. Uh, how about community health and safety? Michelle? Um, yes, I have a couple comments. Um, so on November 14th, we passed a larger motion and then a couple other motions. In that larger motion, we, um, which was number two in that motion, uh, we, agreed to begin exploring the resident oversight board. And um, it seems that that should be added to this category. In vote number three, we agreed that we would review and update APD policies and protocols. Um, and it seems that should also be included. Um, I'm not sure whether number four, Four, um, which was to continue to develop protocols for CREST regarding active engagement by community responders. Um, that may already be covered in A of this, um, but certainly the resident oversight board um, and the policies and protocols, um, which have already been agreed upon in our motion, I think should be added to this section of the implementation. Okay, Mindy Jo, you have your hand up. I'm gonna request deleting section B of this, the strategizing a plan to create a youth empowerment center. Delete that. That's my request. Okay, Kathy. Uh, I agree with what Michelle said about the oversight board and the issue when I was reading through these, we have racial equity and social justice and DEI, and I would have put it with that, but but I I, I didn't know where to put it, you know, be, since we've assigned that um, it it fits with health and safety better than it does racial equity and social justice. But when we get down to that, I may be left with just one thing there. So I was wondering whether we want to. Um, collapse, because I'm, as I said, I'm getting 13 different uh, areas. So we, when we get down to that, but I also thought that the empowerment center didn't fit here, but the police oversight board did. Okay. One other thing, just on Chris, um, we have it in the finance guidelines, but the, we we have a um, continuing implementation, but we talked about we really want to um, that and tracking to me is a separate issue. You know, reporting back on the progress, assessing the experience. We really need your know, report once it goes live for a year. Um, so I was going to break that into two thoughts rather than one long thought. Okay. Dorothy. 
I would not remove create a youth empowerment center unless we plan to totally go back on all the things we talked about for many months this year. Okay, Shalini. I think youth empowerment um, belongs here because it's community health. It's related to that. Um, I am okay with making it youth empowerment programming or, I mean, I think what we do need is what I'm hearing at least from um, many young people and parents, uh, especially in BIPOC families is that there's a great need for um, mentoring, programming, programs, uh, resources, access to technologies, all of this to engage the young youth in a productive way. So um, I guess all of that would be, I, I just mean like center should not meet, doesn't have to mean that we're going to build a new thing, but like utilizing a space in town to offer this kind of mentoring, programming, and so forth. So I really do believe that should be a focus. And it, I think it belongs here because it's community health. With regard to the Youth Empowerment Center, um, there were other better words maybe in the motion, and that would be what I think we would need to pick up. Uh, Kathy? Dorothy? Okay, then we're going on to economic vitality. Shalini? I remember when uh, in our first term working with Paul through these goals and he would ask us, you know, in terms of the smart of like, is it measurable? Is it um, da, da, da? And so what, how would we make these measurable and actionable and like, is it too broad? And is it, you know, how would we, um, yeah, how would we measure? Um. Paul, did you want to comment on that at this point? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I do look at these in terms of how would I report to you whether I've achieved your goal or not. Um, actually, I don't say I shouldn't say they're your, they're our goals because I think this is this will be a conversation as we move forward. Um, when they're broader like that, it's easier to. Sometimes when they're very specific, it's easy to meet, right? You know, did you do this? Yes, I did. You know, A plus, never an A plus, but you know. Um, especially from Hampshire College, you don't get grades. Um, but then, but sometimes when they're too broad, it's sort of like, well, did I, I think the clarity comes from what youth envision what it means to achieve this. So hearing you articulate what that really means is helpful. It doesn't have to actually be put in words necessarily precisely, but understanding what that looks like to you. And that can happen either in this document or in a conversation either way. So I understand more about what you're talking about. So just a comment on that question, Chalini, for instance, under 3B, facilitating zoning bylaws, we just did a serious look at, first look at the revision tonight, come back next week for a vote. And it's all about supporting our businesses. So to me, that's the kind of measurable thing. Staff worked hard on it and they came back to us. Just an example. Anna. Uh, you said that like you're kind of tired of me raising my hand, Len. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Never mind. I was just asking you. Um, so I agree with Shalini that uh, you know, I mean, if we're using the smart criteria, we are we this is gonna be ages. Um, and I recognize that there's benefit to breadth in the goal. And that first goal is a little bit rough for me, um, in terms of it's very, very broad, right? So not that I don't think Paul would sail over the 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 mark but i think that you know you could do very little and say you achieved this goal and I, i'm not saying you would do that but it's possible so um I, I would like to explore that a little bit more um and that's not a helpful directive to mandy to take forward so um this is me doing what i don't like doing and presenting problems and not solutions one of the things that is not in here and i 
would like to just mention it is exploring the possibility of what it would mean, and, and maybe this goes under finances, but what the financial implications of examining having a economic development director again would look like um, and what that would cost for the town. I'm not saying do it, but I think that it's something that we should be prepared to at least understand the implications and, and the need for. And maybe you already have that um, because we've had one in the past, but that's something that um, is not on here that has been discussed in the past in terms of economic vitality. Pam? I'd like to see in this section some reference at least to um, strategic measure or strate strategic planning with UMass, Amherst College, Hampshire College, because I think that I think that ties into the economic the, the vitality. So if we can just reference it, please. When you say that, you mean around economic development? Okay, Jennifer. Can I ask a question about yes. that? So that's different than the separate goals regarding, like there's a specific section on part relationship with UMass Amherst College and, and you're thinking something separate than that completely? I think the, the specific one with the strategic um, relationships does mention economic development, things that would enhance the economic vitality and I'm and maybe we just talk about does it does that portion of it sit with the UMass strategic initiatives piece or does it get pulled out and and brought into economic vitality okay but it, it could be that it sits and stays in the UMass section for the, for the sake of discussion it's in the UMass section now yeah let's just keep moving on the discussion not where it goes but that it's there anything else Pam um, Jennifer, you had your hand up. Um, well, I was going to say what Anna said is um, looking at it, uh, I do think we should revisit the economic development uh, position. And I'm not quite sure. I mean, facilitating the review and revision of the zoning bylaws to increase and support economic development throughout the town. Is that, it, that seems like something for the council to, to it's, take. Yeah, but it, it, uh, let me just, let me excuse me for speaking up. Um, let me um, just mention that when we did look at zoning or bylaws in the first term, um, the the staff was very involved in pointing in the direction of which ones they thought needed some attention. So it can start either place. I don't think it starts one or the other. Yeah, well, I think it should it, together. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, just concerned about I'm not suggesting I, it's not so together. I, I'm not necessarily comfortable with how it. Right, I'm not suggesting council. it's not together. It, it's a two-way street is what I'm suggesting. If you want language there that suggests that, that maybe would make you more comfortable. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, major capital investment. Andy? Yes, um, I'm uncomfortable with creating an additional major capital investment without a pro more process and discussion in the council, specifically the last thing about uh, proposing funding options for the renovation and uh, maintenance of the track and athletic fields at the high school. Um, it has another problem with it in addition to what I just said, which is that the Amherst Regional High School is not under our jurisdiction. It's under the school, Regional School Committee's jurisdiction and uh, the responsibility to maintain um, the fields is really a responsibility of four towns, not a single town. And I find the last piece then um, and other locations in town is being somewhat vague and not tied to anything than if you take the other out. So that whole last section, I think, uh, is a concern. Okay, Kathy. Um, I have, a, uh, I'll start, I'll try to build off Andy and then I, I want to go back up a couple. I took that last piece and moved 
the talk about track and field to the part on infrastructure without a specific figure out how to do it, but I, I made it part of our long-term. I think that in the long-term capital plan we have, we've been missing track fields, at recreational fields. We've done vehicles, we've done buildings. So I just moved it out of this section. And when we get to that other one, I'll talk about exactly how, but I'm. it's not clear to me why we would start on a schematic design for the central fire station if we don't know where it is going to go. And so I would rather the attention, see if we could figure out where the two of these are going to go over the next 12 months. You know, I, I making this a narrower set of action on DPW and fire, because we, we've had them linked. And I was, when we started to talk about the DPW building the other day, it seemed to me it was still the building that had been conceived of a while ago when I heard the scale of it. So I think trying to figure out the two pieces of land. So I was going to collapse the two locations to try to see if at the end of this next 12 months, we could say, okay, DPW is going to be here, wherever it is, and fire is going to be here. But I wouldn't start to design it before we know those two things. You can't design, do a schematic design before. Right. You know. And so, so, and that's why it has comma if appropriate. And, and Lynn, I just think it's too much. And Paul is on, when I think of staff, they're on two building committees right now and two mm -hmm. schematic designs. So I, I'm thinking of how plate, full the plate is. And this is something that feels like. Um, the first part needs to happen first because we've got the same people on these, you know, unless you miraculously come up with some other folks to be on it. Um, that's what I'm worried about, that schematic design um, phase, wasting wasting money if we haven't figured out the two of them. So that was just why I would remove it um, as a specific action for the next 12 months. Anything else on major capital, Pam? Yeah, I would I would second what Kathy just said, um, that that D doesn't seem to be appropriate here. And then on F, it I was unsure. Um, I, I think we've contributed money to the track and field, and I don't think um, we need to contribute more. Um, the other locations in town is a totally different ball of wax and and i like the idea of moving it to infrastructure that was a good idea it, it really is the only one we have any control over is town owned fields so that's we don't have control over the a or ha okay uh anything else on this one i'm moving on to housing affordability Kathy, do you have your hand up? No, I did. Pat, Pat probably has her hand up because I was going to say what she already said. So Pat should say it. Pat, go ahead. I don't know. What... <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I already said before about the shelter. Uh, I would like to see this microphone. I would like to see this uh, talk about how did I rewrite it? Prioritizing initiatives to create uh, increase home ownership opportunities. Um, and where is this? Um, and uh, for uh, access to safe, affordable housing for low and moderate income residents. So both to increase home ownership opportunities for the, but also to make sure there's access to safe and affordable housing. In addition, I really wanted to say um, that we want to ensure the continued operation of a seasonal shelter uh, and while working on the development of a permanent or facilitating the development of a permanent uh, year-round shelter, something okay. like that. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, in response to what Pam Rooney said way a couple hours ago about retaining single family homeowners, homes for purchase by families or something like that, you. Well, well, but I wanted to say, if we're going to put that in, I want to put in that we need to add housing because we need more housing. And so the two go together. And I, so I would say, um, you know, adding housing for 
families and singles. Increase housing stock and home ownership. Yeah. Pam? Yeah, Pam. I think we could simplify it by just saying prioritizing initiati initiatives to retain and increase because retention of existing homes is as much a strategy as increasing others. I, I guess it's increasing, not just for families in my mind. Okay. Oh, you're, you're talking about the first part. Okay, I've got it like split into three different now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and we don't see yours at this point, Mandy Jo. Jennifer? I think families should be in there because there, we, we build housing for non-families. I, I just <laughs> want to be very- We're, we're not at a loss for that. I'm, um, okay, I won't speak out of turn, but I will speak after something. Dorothy? I agree. I was counting in my head and I think they have 15 new apartment buildings. Um, and yes, some of them may be suitable for families, some of the ones that we're planning, but uh, families are not what has been prioritized in all of those 15 projects, which have been, are in the process, have been built or in the process of being built around town. So I think we need to talk about family housing. Thank you. Anna. Yeah, we're treading dangerously close to trying to define what makes a family and who gets to live Thank in a single you. family home. So I want to be really careful about that, especially Thank as you. someone who's a single person who lives in a single family home. Uh, Anna, thank you. I don't need to say anything more, but it's a sore spot in my mind. Uh, Jennifer? Oh, oh, I would, I know this is going to get some people's ire up, but I call them non-student households they could be one but we are not we are build we are building a lot of housing to serve our student population which is fine but we have not really built any for our non-student households whether that be one person or however and that is a fact that the statistics bear that out okay mandy joe Dorothy, Jennifer, Dorothy, did you want to take your hand on Dorothy? Muted, Dorothy. We can't hear you, Dorothy. Sorry, I thought I did take it down. So no, okay. now it's down. Yes. All right. Uh, we're moving on to racial equity and social justice. Michelle? I just, I wanted to respond to Kathy's earlier comment. I, I actually have no attachment to this being here at all. I just wondered in terms of, um, so I think you're right, Kath, we already have the committee, we have the support for the committee, we have the fund, we're moving forward. Um, but it seems like for other items that were sort of in process working on that we do include it as like just a sort of frame of reference just to have it in there. So I'm wondering if you see some other possibility, maybe it's different language or um, it has a different place or something like that, but just so that it's not lost and forgotten um, that we are doing some really great work on this and that we're in process of working on it. Kathy? Yeah, I'll respond. I mean, I don't I think of the town manager goals as an action plan for him and staff, not a restatement of everything we've endorsed. And that's why I said, I don't think it goes here, um, belongs here. It's not to say that we're not doing this, but in the next 12 months, I don't see an, there will be a need for a lot of manager and staff focus time on this. There's a lot of committee work on it and there may be a lot of council time on it. So that's why I wouldn't put it here because I wouldn't have any way of judging him on it and him and the staff. So I, I do, I mean, I have a similar problem with housing affordability just on a, what do we actually think 
the town staff can do in that area that we would then hold Paul accountable for. Um, aside from, you know, uh, the the shelter and some of the things, but I won't worry about if it fails to happen in the next 12 months, but that's why I th didn't think it went here, Michelle. It wasn't to take it down as less. There are a lot of things we work on that aren't necessarily town manager next year, 12 month goals. But I, if, if the oversight board doesn't go here, we then have a high level race, equity, and social justice that only has one thing in it. So, so my, what I had put in there was the oversight board because that the DEI director is the one who's working on that. So I'll let others figure out how to work on things structurally, um, whether we have a whole separate section on race, equity, and social justice, or we hold it in, or whether we have a second thing, because I couldn't think of a second thing other than the oversight board. I believe this needs to remain here. We're expecting a very significant report coming from AHRA. And if we combine these back into uh, a, both talking about council and town manager, uh, that report's coming to us. It's been scheduled for a long time and AHRA is working hard on it. So. I, I think it needs to stay here because it's going to be something we're going to be focusing on this year. Pat? Can hear Pat at all. So equity and social justice. I would make sure, I would like to see that the resident over the uh, implementation of the resident oversight board Yes, it's coming out of DEI, but it is part of the manager's work. Um, and I think it needs to be there. Um, and I also feel like that it is that the implementation or the continued implementation of uh, anti-racism trainings continue with the staff or or however, because and and yeah. Uh, that's it for now. Okay, Kathy. Okay, uh, Pat, please take your hand down. We're going on to infrastructure management and maintenance. Anna. Sure, so I want to pull apart number six on the list a little bit. Um, admin administering wetlands permits is something that's regulated by bylaw and has been done uh, with immense care by our uh, wetlands administrator for many years. I don't think it needs to be in here. Um, and I spoke to, um, yeah, the, thank you. I was like the, the person who suggested it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Pam and I spoke and we agree that the, the spirit of this is about really maintaining the conservation lands based on best practices for biodiversity and recreation. And I'm actually, you know, in rereading, I'm wondering if there's ways to incorporate that under point four. Um, so really this is about creating a, a plan um, for improvements and maintenance of, I guess might, might cover that. Uh, basically making sure that we are following best practices to ensure biodiversity of the habitat that we are protecting. Okay, Mandy Joe. It was covered. Okay, Kathy. I think Anna just addressed part of what I was gonna do in that um, the creating a plan, but I wanna put the words a multi-year plan. <laughs> Um, cause I, mm -hmm. it, and then improve and maintain and after recreational land, I was put comma, including tracks, town owned tracks and fields or town owned fields. We don't own any tracks. I don't. Okay. Think. So then just including town owned, owned fields. Um, so then the next one, number five, um, it said proposing a plan, um, for town owned unused project. I, I, I'm not gonna word this right, but what I think we need to be doing is setting up a way to come up with a plan rather than telling Paul to just go out and get the plan. So it might be an ad hoc, ad hoc committee that says here are our unused 
property. So it was just a rewarding of this because I think we need to have this plan, but I don't think the Paul and staff and staff need to do it by themselves. I think this would potentially involve a few towns of people. When I'm watching East Hampton and other towns say, we've got these properties, what do we want to do with them? And they're not talking to their town manager to tell us what to do with them. So coming up with proposing options or coming up with a plan to develop options. So it's just rewording that. I did like number five a lot. Anna? I think, Kathy, I, I think field and recreation space are redundant to list twice. Yeah. Um, I think recreation land is predominantly fields. So once we have it in there, you no, think it's, it's taken care of? It's I, I think it's it's in there. Yeah, I, I do think it's taken care of. That's Great. my opinion. It's also tennis courts and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah, but it encompasses fields with basketball and, courts yeah. and so forth. I, I don't think we need to pull out fields. I guess is what I'm or add in additional language. Um, what I was, what I'd like to see also in here is look at the um, a, a reexamination of the pedestrian infrastructure plan that was created by the Transportation Advisory Committee many years ago. Um, pedestrian and cyclist infrastructure plan, I believe, is what it was called. Um, and incorporating that within the um, within the maintenance of our town roads, and, and then in terms of the title, uh, I'm curious about infrastructure and land stewardship as a kind of a mishmash of the two things. I like the word stewardship a whole lot, so that was a thought. Okay, um, I just want to tie together the fact that in the financial guidelines, there is a discussion of the fact that we already have some guidance for how to deal with unused property. And there has been a suggestion made that that uh, guidance be referred to the Finance Committee for review. So once that is completed, it is conceivable that we could begin uh, developing a proposed plan. So maybe we just need to modify the expectation, but still keep in uh, the development of a, the, you know, begin the development of a proposed, of a plan for town owned yeah, unused property, something like that. Any other comments there? Now, yeah, in the, no, I want it here because it ties to something that's in the financial guidelines. So it, it ties the two together. Uh, community engagement questions? Michelle? I had two items um, that were from our larger motion on November 14th. Um, the first one was the community visioning which was number one in the larger motion. And um, the second was create training for racial equity and the rights, know your rights training. Um, I don't know if this is, I, I think this is a good spot for both of those to be in. But um, again, these were voted on the 14th. It's number one and number six in the larger motion. And it's community visioning and the training um, for racial equity, et cetera. So the question will be, do that? does it go here or does it go back up under those goals? But it yeah. needs to go somewhere, okay? Yeah. Andy? Yeah, on uh, number three, uh, I have several comments. One is that I think we have some youth programming, but not enough because we have the recreation department. It is doing a fair amount, and I don't want to undersell them by saying that we don't have anything, and then which is... When you say implementing, it's sort of like we don't have anything. Um, and second of all, I am um, very supportive of um, calling out consistent with uh, prior discussions that this council and prior council has had the um, focus on BIPOC, but it's not exclusively BIPOC. I think that there are other youth, including uh, low income, um, youth who are not BIPOC, for example, who would benefit also. 
So I would suggest a modification of the language what I could come up with is um, implementing youth programming in a particular uh, that incorporates involvement of youth and addresses the needs of BIPOC and low-income youth. Okay, Anna. Uh, thank you. I'm very unclear on what number four means. Maximizing the contributions of town multiple member bodies to the municipality. Um, I don't know if there's any clarity on that one. And then this is where I would really like to see the addition of um, a database to track the town's energy transition. Um, it could go under infrastructure, but it's really about a publicly available dashboard um, to give visibility to the town's efforts and verify the completion of goals specifically towards our climate action goals. So I think it it does it could go under either, but because the dashboard would cover more than infrastructure, it should go under community engagement. Okay, Mandy Joe. So I was going to recommend deleting number four. Um, I think Paul, for many years, has said how how do I do this and yeah. also how do yeah. you rate yeah. me on this right. so I think we should just delete it is yeah. my recommendation yeah okay doing a great job gang keep going relationship to the town council wait sorry can I ask I'm sorry yes I apologize um there is something about reevaluating charges on a regular basis and so I'm wondering about that we've talked about some committees that have specifically TAC that has requested kind of a re-examination of their charge. I'm wondering if it's it's a better if it's better suited. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, words are not working right. If it would make more sense to say something along the lines of reevaluate as appropriate committee charges to ensure they are contributing to the municipality effectively or something like that. Okay. I like that. Yeah. yeah. But this is where no, these are Paul's... met these are mixed council and manager. Yeah. Okay. Relationship with the town council. I mean to Joe, you had your hand up on the okay. Relationship with the town council. Shorten its meetings. Um okay. Moving on, relationship. I'm sorry, Pam. Yes. Um, it does say very specifically long range goals. That that's that's one of the contributions, and yet we keep coming back to trying to to focus on year long efforts. So I just want to make sure that we're keeping that in mind. Okay. Got it. Uh, relationship with the University of Massachusetts Amherst College and Hampshire College. I, I just want to make sure that the, um, I'm sorry, I didn't put my hand up. Mandy Joe. So in the, it says executing robust strategic partnership agreements. That word is very subjective, so I would delete it. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Are you taking robust out? <laughs> yes, that would that was okay with. Ex, I would put exec, executing the strategic partnership and add that provide financial and community benefits to Amherst. We're looking for money, but you know, I must say, if UMass or Amherst said you can use our fields, we would like that too. Um, you know, so that they they could give something in kind. So I just want to add what could be in these to it. Okay, and I want to make sure that we don't lose the piece that was up in the town council goals around um, um, state legislation uh, regarding pilots. Uh, I also just, <laughs> I love this goal and I hate this goal. And the reason I love this goal is because I would love to see it happen. And the reason I hate this goal is because the town manager does not have control over the three higher ed institutions and frankly can't make them do anything except pay their water and sewer bills. And so I just want to be clear, be clear that I love this goal and I hate this goal. Okay. So uh, we are done.
No, we're not. Uh, Kathy, you still have your hand up? Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Flipping back and forth from my other screen so I forget to take my hand down. It's down. Okay, Michelle? Two questions. One is, um, and I maybe could talk to Mandy about this and GOL, but um, does this, the, do the town manager goals need a bit of a cover memo um, that pulls out some of these more um, general topics we've been talking about, like timelines, like resources, things like that? So that's just a question to sit with. Um, also, when I was gone, did we do discharging of firearms? Yes, we did. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. We so was did. that a first reading tonight? Yeah, or that was a first reading. Yes. Oh, and no. and Mandy Jo got called on to fill in and perfect. Uh, and yes, we took care of it very fast. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Absolutely. Anything else? Jennifer? I, I just feel that I need to explain myself. I will do this quickly. Um, there's no Oh, there is no, um, the, the point I was trying to make is that I think that the town is doing a good job of building housing like Olympia Place, Spring Street, 11 to 13 East Pleasant, Kendrick Place, 1 East Pleasant, Sunset Fearing LLP, um, and uh, the Sunset Fearing townhouses, and the list goes on, and they're all well and good. They are designed for students at prices they're, they are not, not being built for non-student households. The price are out of reach for almost all student household, non-student households. And every time a house becomes a group house, that's a house lost to a non-student household. And since we're not building what would be starter houses, we really need to address this issue of only building for non-student again, households, losing the ones that we have, and we're building a new elementary school, we're expanding our library, really for our non, you know, our year round population. So it's a little out of sync to not be to be dismissive of or of um, ensuring that we maintain and expand housing opportunities for our year round non-student households, whatever you know, term you want to apply, um, because those you know, are the people that will be sending children to our schools and using our libraries and supporting the year round economy. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Shalini? Um, just clarifying, commenting questions. Um, so Jennifer, when you're saying that we're not building, we're building for students and we're not building for families, you mean the developers because the town is not building these, right? Yes, it's not. We When we lose housing that families and non-student households were formerly living in, they're not being replaced with, yes. So it, because the, the the housing market, it's not, profitable for them to it's happening across the country to build starter houses that's not where the economic incentive is so what you're proposing is that we add a town manager goal to incentivize somehow like allow for density in because the starter homes they're not profitable for i mean this is probably a discussion in crc but it's basically discussion. I think we yeah. need to, it has to be some kind of a priority to maintain and, ex and expand our year round population because right. we're losing that. And for any community, that's not a sign of a healthy community to be having your population right. decline. I just, I just mean to point out that it's not the town that's building them, it's the developers, right? So but what you're suggesting is that we create incentives for starter homes or homes for uh, lower income, or how do we incentivize people or developers to invest in um, homes for young families or individuals and so forth, right? Probably another conversation, but you know, there are towns that might it's another conversation, you know, limit. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, Mindy Joe, thank you. And for working with us. Uh, we have no appointments. We did committee and liaison reports last week. Mandy Joe, what else do you need? I have a committee report. Oh, sorry. Please, <laughs> There's go something ahead. new. All right. <laughs> um, I didn't see it on there. Okay. Um, CRC has set the interview date for um, ZBA associate member vacancy interviews for next Tuesday. Is We're in December, right? December 20th at 10 a.m. on Zoom. December 20th, 10 a.m. Okay. Are there any other committee or liaison reports? Kathy? Just very quickly, um, we are, the school building committee is going to sponsor two forums, and I'll say this again next Monday with dates and Zoom, but in case you want to put it in your calendar, on January 25th in the morning, and on January 26 in the evening, they'll be exactly the same, but it's giving people two different opportunities. And at that point, the building design pictures will be up, up, including the outdoors. And we are expecting to have the cost estimates for the building the week before. Okay, Dorothy. Um, CSSJC is concerned that their goals be considered, and we did discuss some of them tonight, the Oversight Board, the Youth Empowerment Center, um, and just, you know, waiting to see those things come into uh, reality. That's it. Okay. Pam? Yeah, on the, uh, the mention of the ZBA uh, vote, before that comes back to council with, um, for us to approve um, the, C the CRC um, proposal, um, it would be very, very helpful to have in hand the KP law or some some uh, finding on which method of counting abstentions um, is going to be adopted or used in that discussion. Does that make sense? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Andy? Good. Two reports. One, the Finance Committee um, is meeting on Thursday, as mentioned earlier, at three o'clock in a Zoom meeting. And there are three principal agenda items. Uh, one is to finish the guideline discussion based upon uh, the draft that Kathy put together from all of the comments received. The second is to talk about a little bit further. Um, we've started work on the real estate transfer um, fee legislation because it has to be proposed to the legislature uh, by the council. So we're trying to work on that. And um, the third one is uh, I had a request from the finance director to include on the agenda um, a first discussion of the uh, acquisition of the property that has been owned by VFW. Um, and uh, so those are the three items. The other thing I was going to mention is that I am a liaison to the Transportation Advisory Committee. I usually don't report on it, but this time I'm going to real quickly. Um, the committee feels that they have a lot of expertise and a lot of members who have uh, built up a substantial expertise on the field of uh, transportation and uh, safe streets and uh, related set topics, and that they are not a, um, they're an underutilized committee and they don't understand their role with the council and with TSO, and uh, so that they would like to have more consideration given to how um, we want to define their role. And uh, I think that's been presented to TSO now is the logical place to go. Um, but in any event, I wanted to let the full council know about that. So thank you. Thank you. Kathy? I just uh, CPA, I'm the liaison for them. And this Thursday, they've already started to do their straw poll among the competing proposals they have 
far more things than they can fund, but there are two great big housing proposals on it. So if anyone wants to just listen in as they try to figure out, it's uh, it's uh, they meet at six o'clock on Thursday and it will be posted. They also have a proposal that would partially fund the fields at Fort River and it would lower the amount that we would need to ask taxpayers, but they they've got a lot more money being asked for than they have money to allocate. Pam, you have your hand up. Okay, Jen, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I'm the kind of absent um, council liaison to the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust. And um, it's something we may wanna take up in January, but I really regret I have almost, they meet one Thursday a month and I almost always have to appear or be at the TSO meeting. And I feel terrible, but I have missed many of their meetings. So okay. I think somebody else should, I should pass that okay. on to someone who can be there more present. That's something we usually look at in January. Um, are there any other uh, committee or liaison reports? No minutes, Paul, comments? Um, Paul and I will be uh, doing state of the town addresses next week and as well will brief presentations from the library and the school and a very quick preview of the new elementary school is being proposed as part of the state of the town. Okay. Uh, with that, the meeting's adjourned. Oh, shut up.